in the home stretch of the Woods Watch Party season, and we're ready for week eight of the 2020 virtual football campaign. This time, we're taking you back to the penultimate game of the 2017 season. The Big Green came in with a record of 6-2, and two, with some impressive road wins at Stetson, Sacred Heart, and Penn. But on this Friday night, they'd be taking a rather unique road trip. The host for this classic game against Brown, none other than historic Fenway Park. Hey everybody, it's Dart with ESPN Plus football broadcaster Tyler Murray. Great to have you with us for another edition of the Woods Watch Party. A bit of a different spin this week. It's been a very busy week for Dartmouth former players and current coaches. So we wanted to make sure you didn't miss this, even though we won't have any special guests this week. We're excited for the next couple of weeks to wrap up the 2020 Woods Watch Party season. But this is one you just have to see for yourself. If you hadn't seen it before, it's a great one. Dartmouth against Brown at Fenway Park on a cold, cold night. The Big Green going up against the Bears and the Elements in Boston. Today's game is brought to you by the Richards Group. The Richards Group is proud to be the official insurance agency of Dartmouth Athletics. They're local, independent, and committed to the Upper Valley. Contact them to review your home, auto, and business insurance needs. Our friends at the Richards Group say, go Big Green. Enjoy. Getting ready to tee up a little Ivy League football here inside Fenway Park. Brown playing host to Dartmouth. Kickoff coming right up. But first, let's say hello to the third member of our team tonight, Carolyn Mano. She's with Dartmouth head coach Buddy Tevens. Paul, well, hey, how are you? And, Coach, you grew up about an hour from here. Your team right now coming out of the visiting clubhouse. What's this experience been like for you so far? It's, just, it's a, a dream come true uh, to be a Boston kid and get on the field at Fenway Park especially for my players from around the country. They have this opportunity. It's really special. There's still work to do. You guys are in contention for the Ivy League title. What are the keys to success for you tonight? Uh, field position, ball control. We've got to move the football on the ground, mix up some pass, and play real steady defense. Got to get to their pass a little bit tonight. As our analysts have noted, it's very cold out here. It's a little bit windy as well. Do you expect that to be a factor? Uh, the wind may be with the, the kicking game, a little bit the deep passing game, but control stuff should be okay. Uh, and we have young guys. They don't, this doesn't bother <laughs> them at all. But no gloves for the head coach because he's a tough guy. Coach, thank you. All right, Paul, back up to you. Carolyn, thank you very much. Also, no headgear for the coach. I see Carolyn keeping the ears warm, buddy, not even doing that. Wow, man. I mean, he is impressive. I'll credit more the toughness than I will the intelligence with Coach Stevens <laughs> right now. And he, he mentioned to Carolyn how important ball control is going to be tonight. First of all, we have the weather and the wind. We're in the 20s. It's going to be dropping throughout the evening. But it's also been their identity to run the football. And for the first time in a while, Ross, they are quite healthy at running back. They are. They get Miles Smith back, which is huge for them. Smith was able to rush for over 100 yards, 111 to be exact, on 17 carries against Brown last year. Both these teams really would like to be able to run the ball tonight. And you know the way it is, Paul, when the weather's like this, not just the wind, but also just how cold it is. It makes it harder to catch passes, harder to hold on to the ball. And Dartmouth won the toss. Uh, they deferred Brown, excited, trying to get that first win in Ivy League play. And I mentioned, Ross, that it looks nice out here. We were also down on the field and commenting, we couldn't believe for this climate how nice the grass was. It's, it, it's like the grass you go on a football field in a warm weather climate. It's impeccable. It really is. And this is a special, special night for these young men. Even the Brown seniors, this is senior night. They showed a picture of all of them playing Pop Warner football with their parents on the field. And one thing that's truly unique, and we'll see throughout the game, both teams are on the same sideline. They're both out there in left, left center field. It's something you rarely see. I remember back at old Milwaukee County Stadium where the Packers used to play. You used to see the teams on the same sideline. But we were talking to the quarterbacks out there tonight, T.J. Linton and also Jack Hennigan, about it might be a little difficult to get signals. If you're on the 10-yard line and you're Jack Hennigan, the Dartmouth quarterback down in the outfield, you're looking for signals 60 yards away. That's a little different than it is on most weekends. Correct. Usually the coach is as far down on his part of the sideline as he can be so you're never really looking more than 25 30 yards away tonight these quarterbacks at times will have to look 70 75 yards away at their coaches Phil Estes for Brown and he's known a lot of success in his 20 seasons but this year so far we can't count it as success but if you you know how it is Ross we've been on teams at the end of the year you get to November things haven't been going your way if you can knock off a team or two that's thinking about that title 
all of a sudden, September and October feel like a long time Correct, ago. and he's done an unbelievable job. I mean, they've won three Ivy titles under Estes, and 16 of his 19 years, Brown has finished in the top half of the Ivy League. That's incredible. Buddy Tevens on the other side in his second stint as the head coach. The Dartmouth won its first five games, went on a two-game skid, and won last week at Cornell. Back deep for the Bears to receive Isaac Whitney. And the freshman, Scott Boylan. That'll be touchback, and T.J. Linza will begin the senior quarterback with the Brown offense. And you saw him last week, Ross, against Yale, and they had some success on the ground early but struggled with the wind up there, the Yale ball, through the air. And let's take a look at the Brown starting offense presented by TIAA. The strength of the offensive line is the offensive tackles. Clayton Eubank is a pretty impressive prospect at right tackle. And one of the things that's cool about Brown and their head coach, Phil Estes, he plays all the seniors, starts them on senior night. Don't know many Division I teams that do that. So there's a bunch of guys starting at the skill positions especially that have never gotten to start before for Brown. That's cool. T.J. Linta, the senior, has started throughout the season. Goes right to the air. And the Dartmouth defense bats it right back to him. And that's not the completion that T.J. Linta was thinking about in the first play of the game. He would have been much better off just batting that pass down. They tried to set up the screen to the left. It gets tipped by Jeremiah Duche. And, you know, that's a natural reaction. That's tough to have the presence of mind to just knock it down. Well, that's what you have to do. You lost seven yards by catching that football right there and took a shot. And Dartmouth coaches told us throughout the week what jumps out to them on film, what impresses them the most about their defense is their defensive front. And right away they make a play. Second down 17 after that loss of seven. Brown trying to get some of it back on the ground, but once again, it's the Dartmouth front. They're there to bring up third down and long. Nick Tompkins, probably the best of the bunch up front. He had a career-high eight tackles, including two tackles for loss last week. Jack Trainer, one of their two stud linebackers, he lit up Penn in the game we did earlier this year. And Danny McManus, it feels like the 27th consecutive year Dartmouth has had a McManus in the secondary. It's not. They've had three brothers here, but it's uncanny how many times we've called a game and a McManus has been playing. Starting lineups presented by TIAA, and they get back a chunk there, but didn't quite get to the 30-yard line. Going to be three yards short. They got what they wanted. Darius Days, the freshman tailback, out of the backfield was wide open. The ball was thrown a little bit behind him, but there was nobody near Days there. If he was able to keep his foot as he spun around, his footing, he might have been able to make that play. Brett Estes, you recognize the name. We just talked about his father, the head coach at Brown, and a special story behind him playing here in Fenway Park coming up. Fair catch called, and the Dartmouth Big Green will begin on its own 35-yard line. For more on Brett Estes, here's Carolyn Mano. Hey, Paul, well, for Brett Estes, who is the son of head coach Phil Estes, this is the perfect place to make his first career start. He is a diehard Red Sox fan, and I am talking about the kind of Red Sox fan that hates the Yankees. He spent the entire summer here doing an internship, and in fact, when we talked to Phil Estes on the phone this week, he told me that his screensaver is a photo of the two of them from their very first game here at Fenway Park. And, Paul, the coach noted that when there was discussion that this game would take place at uh, Yankee Stadium, his son said, oh no, absolutely not. And it's certainly paying off tonight. He's been coming here since he was a kid, and you will not find a bigger Red Sox fan on the field tonight. Well, how cool is that to play on on the field where your dad brought you to baseball games? And getting his first start. You're getting his first start as the punter. Brown has an excellent punter in Brett Kopech, but Brett Estes getting a chance to punt the first one tonight. 
Meanwhile, the Dartmouth offense, one play, one first down. Jack Hennigan with the completion. And now Dartmouth right out across midfield and will now be operating inside of Brown territory. Take a look at the Dartmouth starting offense presented by TIAA. They have a huge offensive line, the biggest of the bunch, Matt Kasky, 6'7", 325, and Hunter Hagdorn, only a sophomore, already has over 1,000 yards receiving in his career. He is the biggest playmaker for the Big Green. And the guy expected to get a lot of carries tonight, Ross, to the right of Jack Hennigan. That's Ryder Stone. There he is with it. Bursting through a little gap on the right side, one yard short of a first down. And for the Browns starting defense, presented by TIAA, Ross, what do you see? Richard Dewey Jarvis, the numbers are staggering. Last year he led the league in tackles for losses and sacks. The linebacker level, Gideon Dixon getting the start along with a bunch of seniors. And in the back end, Connor Coughlin leads the team in tackles in the secondary. He had seven solos last week against Yale. Stone pushed back, fighting to get back to the line of scrimmage, and he doesn't do so. Third down and one. The Brown rush defense is there. Big stop early in this game for Brown. After what happened last week, you needed to get something positive going. They try to run the power scheme and terrific penetration in the backfield. They've got a pretty good defensive line. That time it was Michael Hoyt getting the penetration, knocking his offensive lineman back to get the stop for Brown. And what a huge stop for that Brown defense, Ross. You saw him last week in the first quarter against Yale. All kinds of big plays on the ground and through the air. And producing a three and out right away. Late flag coming in there just as the ball went out of bounds. Both defenses on a cold night. Coming up with stops to get their team started as the offense still looking to get going. The two officials on the right side have the right idea with those ear warmers there. That's the right <laughs> idea. Phil Estes will see T.J. Linton come back out on the field for Brown's second possession. Good look at Fenway Park. We have just gotten started between Dartmouth and Brown. Welcome back to beautiful Fenway Park in their gridiron series. Dartmouth and Brown just getting started. And I don't know about a quarterback, but for a right-handed hitter, this right here is a beautiful target. The Green Monster, one of the most iconic walls in all of sports. And the wall here has been around since the original construction of Fenway Park in 1912. And this is something that most people don't get to see. I'm going to take you inside manual scoreboard, the only one like it in Major League Baseball. And I've got some scoreboard operators in here who are actually scoring the game that way tonight. You can see it on the outside. These guys normally work in the games at Fenway Park. But this is a really exciting look inside this incredible iconic green monster here at Fenway and I think Paul and Ross I can see you guys out there can you see me yes hi. we can <laughs> see you waving right back okay, at you it's way warmer for starters <laughs> <laughs> I can't see the field quite as well but I think I'm not going anywhere I really like this Carol that was really really a fun thing to see back behind I've watched games at Fenway Park forever from the stands and also on TV I've never seen back behind that Carolyn I know you worked here in this market for four years. Have you seen back behind the scenes of Fenway much before tonight? No, you know, I've never actually gotten the opportunity to go back here, so this is a thrill for me. But like you said, I have been coming to the ballpark many a time, covering the Red Sox. I also covered the Bruins and the Patriots and the Celtics at the time. But to see the way that this field has been transformed and just to remember some of the things that I experienced here with the Red Sox, walking down, you know, all the baselines and just seeing everybody's some familiar faces that I used to work with. It's just been such an incredible experience for me, Paul. I think she's too comfortable right there. She I think might she not come back there. out to the side. I think she should so stay there the rest of the game. <laughs> I've never seen the, the, the green monster with yards and down on it. All right, right, you know what? Send the coaches to me in here. Can you can you just send them to me? I've got my scoreboard operators back here. We're nice and cozy. Maybe we could get a little bit of hot chocolate going. Just um, go ahead and have uh, Phil and Buddy come my way. <laughs> Thinking it's about a 40-yard walk for either coach there. T.J. Linta firing incomplete. Penalty marker 
coming out late. Carolyn, nice job there. That was fun to see back behind the scenes. Having a little issue or uh, multiple issues with the referee's mic there. We'll work on those. Well, I can tell you what it was. It was pass interference against Danny McManus, and it gives Brown their first first down. A little bit more breathing room. Tail back to the right of T.J. Linta is Darius Days, the top running back for Brown. First down and 10 coming up here. Linta back to the air. Nice pocket to throw from. Looking down the sideline as Days had snuck out there. And Linta didn't leave that one on the field. Boy, that's really good coverage by Eric Miley. To be stride for stride with a fast running back like Darius Days like that. Watch him. He's stride for stride with him. The Days needs to run that route not down the sideline like that. He needs to be a little bit more in the field of play. Credit Miley, though, for pushing him out that way, riding him out that way. And Linta also, likewise, needs to try to keep that ball in the field of play so Days can at least have a chance to make a play on it. Wind could have come into play there. You saw when we came on the air. 20 mile per hour winds expected throughout the evening. Empty backfield, three wide outs to the left, and Linta looks to the left, fires complete to the 23 yard line. And Glamberg well short of a first down. That'll bring up third down and five. Well, the one thing you see right away is that TJ Linta's got an arm on him. I mean, he, he rifled that ball right to Blamberg. McKinnon Crudden right there. One of the captains for Dartmouth, their nickelback, was there to make the tackle. That position's become so important, really, at every level of football. The nickelback and the slot receiver. Feels like we barely even talked about those positions 10, 15 years ago, Paul. Now, it's especially on third downs here, it's an important matchup. The field probably 75% of the time. And Linton wanted to go with the shovel pass, and the Dartmouth rush was in the way. That's a completion. To Aquara. He has one completion to himself and one to an offensive lineman. That's got to be a Fenway Park record. Look it up, somebody. Here we go. TJ Linta, they, here's what they wanted to do, Paul. They wanted to run a shovel pass. It wasn't there. So Linta eventually just tried to throw it somehow to Logie. That didn't have any prayer right there. Lucky it wasn't intercepted. Look at the hands by Aquara. Back in 22 and 23, that's 1922 and 1923. <laughs> Brown won both of those games against Dartmouth, so maybe maybe they had a couple non-conventional completions there as well. Danny McMahon is back. And he's not going to get a chance to get his hands on that one, although Dartmouth will have a chance of very good field position beginning on its own 49-yard line for their second possession. Punt was only 23 yards. Big Green, 51 yards away from the end zone. We'll see what they do with it when we come back to Fenway Park. Fenway Gridiron Series underway, but just barely. 8-19 left in the first. No score between Dartmouth and Brown. They have played football here quite a bit. Let's go back to 1922. Dartmouth and Brown. And Dartmouth falling to Brown in 22 and also in 1923. And Dartmouth hasn't played here since 1944. When they got shut out by Notre Dame. A little history of what's happened here on the gridiron at Fenway Park. High school championship to kick it off. Boston College has been here quite a few times. Boston Redskins played here for three years before going to D.C. Big break between 56 and 2015 when Notre Dame played Boston College right here. And the AFL's Boston Patriots from 63 to 68. They were also here at Fenway. Almost 60 years between college football games. BC played Notre Dame a couple years ago, a game that was right here on NBCSN. This is terrific. It's a great idea. I'm all for more. You know, Wrigley Field should do this. Yankee Stadium, more football games that can take place in iconic venues, the better. It makes it an event. Great, great crowd tonight. All the luxury boxes up here are full. It's awesome. As I said before, no compromises with this field. You mentioned Wrigley Field, though. They, they had some issues in an end zone when they played Illinois Northwestern a few years back. And as Ryder Stone 
Nice gain there on first down out across the 45-yard line to pick up six yards. Should be a big night for Ryder Stone. He's from Calgary. He's used to this weather. So last week, 10-0 win for Dartmouth over Cornell. It was the kind of balance that Kevin Daft, the offensive coordinator, is looking for. They ran the ball 44 times to only 31 pass attempts. You throw in the cold and the wind, and if it goes Dartmouth's way, they're going to run it a lot more than they throw it tonight. And that'll be one yard short of a Dartmouth first down. Wow, Connor Coughlin. Looked like he was shot out of a cannon there. Mentioned earlier, he had seven solo tackles last week. He has a team high six passes defense. He also wears that number 38 to honor a deceased high school teammate. Big third down and one. Third and short in the last series. And this is Gerbino is now in a quarterback. He will oftentimes keep it himself hands off, and it should be just enough for a big green first down. Ryder Stone getting it done. Just an inside give, and you'll see boom. I don't know if that was part of the helmet that came flying. That was an ear pad or a, a mouthpiece. We can tell you, though, from experience, it hurts more to hit when it's this cold. There's no question about it. Now, once you get the blood flowing a little bit, you get into it, you're okay. But those first couple collisions, you really feel those. Dart Medell operating inside Brown territory. They crossed the midfield mark also on their last series. And wide open out of the backfield. Penalty marker coming in late. Well, Jack Hennigan would like that one back. That might have been partially the win, too, or the conditions, Paul, because he just did not put enough on it. And Vito Penza was wide open at the flat. They got Ryder Stone there for a chop block. That is when a defender is being blocked high and low at the same time. It's a very dangerous play. And usually, it's, it's almost never intentional. What happens is, is a running back usually is going to go block a defender low, and the last second, a lineman tries to get a piece of the guy as well, not knowing the back's coming. And again, over the middle, can't throw it any better than that, and that's how you respond to a 15-yard penalty. Only going to be four yards short of a first down, a strike from Jack Hennigan for a gain of 21. Brown ran a bunch of stunts, and Estrada just ran a little skinny post there almost a, a dig in cut against that brown zone hennigan waited and put that in there perfectly second down four looks a whole lot better after that completion and dartmouth now be right at the first down marker that's miles smith carrying to the left side really good for dartmouth to get smith back had a huge game last year against Brown. He's been in and out of the lineup with injuries this year. They're going to say he's short, bringing up another third and short situation. But you have to imagine that this is four down territory. The last time Trubino handed the ball, this time my guess is he'll take it himself. Trubino fakes the give and puts his head down and powers his way for a big green first down. Good call and great effort by Gerbino. We saw a whole lot of that against Penn in the Ivy opener for both teams. He's just such a big body. He has a good feel for the inside run game. And of course, anytime your quarterback is a running threat, the defense no longer has the number count advantage. You're no longer outnumbered. And when the guy's 6'4", 230 pounds doing it, you're going to get a lot of first downs. And again to the air on first down. Steps up to his left. Run! An easy touchdown from 27 yards away. Hunter Hagdorn, the top receiver for the Big Green. His first catch goes for six. Second consecutive pass by Hennigan down the seam. Good job sliding to his left in the pocket. And Hagdorn gets wide open. That should never happen. He's by far the best deep threat for the Dartmouth Big Green. David Smith on to make it seven to nothing. 
or at least attempt to. That one blocks, comes up short, and it remains six zip. So do we go foul ball there or hit by pitch? <laughs> what are we calling that, foul ball or hit by pitch? We saw Hagdorn act like he hit a home run as he was running off to the sideline, but what he really did is catch a wide open touchdown pass. Hennigan to Hagdorn. No extra point, six nothing, Big Green. Number one for the Big Green with the first big play offensively for Dartmouth. 27-yard touchdown reception for Hunter Hagdorn. Extra point was blocked. Dartmouth on top, six to nothing. You'll see Hunter Hagdorn. He's going to be working against a cover three zone, and he wants to split these two defenders. And you'll see Hagdorn is going to run a skinny post. Now watch it unfold. Terrell Smith, the corner, 28. He thinks he is inside help. But when the inside receiver, Thompson, takes the post, the safety goes with him, enables Hagdorn to be wide open for the touchdown. <laughs> if you're Smith there, you have to hug Hagdorn because nobody else is coming into your zone. you got to treat that like man-to-man -man at that point because the safety has to go with the inside receiver running that deep post. Wind blowing the ball off the tee. It's gusting 15 to 20 miles per hour throughout the night. Temperature started at 27. Expected to drop as the game goes on. That was Hagdorn's fourth touchdown catch of the season. Scott Boylan for Brown. The freshman out to the 24-yard line. Download the NBC Sports app to watch thousands of live sporting events. Stream for free with your NBCSN subscription. For details, visit NBCSports.com slash live. Now the Brown offense uh, finds itself in a familiar position last week. Down early to Yale. They've been outscored by over 100 points in this five-game losing streak. But they do have T.J. Linta, as you mentioned, quarterback with a strong arm and plenty of experience. They really haven't tried to establish the run at all so far tonight. I mean, it's been all throwing it, but this is what Brown football used to be. Those quick wide receiver screens. Not sure why we didn't see that last week against Yale, but talking with Coach Estes for Brown this week, he said, you'll see more of that. Jacob get, Prawl. Get the ball out quick. He gets a nice block downfield from L.J. Harriet. All these guys are sophomores, too. Blandberg, Prawl, Harriet, they're all sophomores, and they're all very talented outside receivers for Brown. Prawl, sophomore from Tip City, Ohio. By far their leading receiver, 42 receptions, now 43 for the season. Sixth best in the Ivy League when it comes to receptions per game, averaging a little more than five. And this is Days right up the middle, and that's the Dartmouth front four. Say, so you're going nowhere, no game. And maybe that's why they're not trying to run it that much. Charlie Ponarelli, one of 10 guys they play up front, number 96. They are big and physical up front. They had three D linemen have at least seven tackles last week. You never see that in college football. They play anywhere from seven to eight throughout, it, throughout the game up front. Say so it keeps them fresh to create the negative plays deep into that second half. Second down, nine. And Linta has it knocked down, and once again, the defensive line for Dartmouth, that's Jake Mullen. Linta had good protection. He wanted to go left with it. And you see, just at the last second, Mullen gets his hand up and gets it on the football. Creates a third and long situation for Brown, the exact situation they've been trying to stay out of showed you the graphic a little bit earlier in the game they're converting on third down only at 27 percent second last in the Ivy League only Dartmouth right now struggling more on third empty backfield two receivers to his left and a trio to his right little pump to his left and that's a perfect strike inside of Dartmouth territory and it'll be first down Brown well that's a great play call by Brown, the pump and go. They fake the wide receiver screen, then they throw it in what you call the turkey hole between the corner and the safety in the cover two defense. And Harriet's able to make the catch. That is well done across the board. Play call, throw, and catch 
by L.J. Harriet. Brown's in business. Harriet, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, does a little bit of everything for Brown. And that side picks up the first down from the Dartmouth 43. Play action today. Zlinda keeps it himself and gets up just past the 40-yard line. And that'll be a gain of three yards. Talking with Phil Estes, the head coach for Brown this week, he said Harriet is a guy they need to get the ball to more. We talked to him during the week. We said, why not get him the ball more? He was Ivy League Rookie of the Week. Last year against Yale, had 92 yards rushing and a touchdown. He said, you're right, we're going to. And we already see them tonight finding the way to get him the ball in space. We saw Linta throwing earlier, throwing a tight spiral down there on the field. And aside from the aesthetics, when you get on a windy night, it's the one time that can really help you. We also noticed H Hennigan for Dartmouth with the same ability. Days now to the 41-yard line. Gain a one. And it'll bring up another third down and long situation. It looked like they might have had something there. They ran the draw. The Dartmouth defenders got up the field. Thought that one had a chance of popping. Lint has shown a lot of patience and maturity this season, Ross. Hanging in there. Every senior quarterback wants to start every game. And it hasn't quite worked out that way for him. But the offense has become his here in the latter part of the season. Empty backfield once again. Dartmouth brings four. Nearly intercepted that time. Yeah, that's Jack Trainer. Terrific coverage there. You see, Linta was looking for his tight end, Anton Casey, and there was nowhere to go there. That's what makes these Dartmouth linebackers so special. I mean, they rack up huge tackles, Paul, in the run game, but they can both cover. We've seen Trainer now man-to-man -man against the tight end. Earlier, we saw Miley run stride for stride with the running back days down the sideline. Brown looks like they're missing a the guy here. A little confusion there in the Brown special They're going to have to take a delay ready. game here. That doesn't hurt you that much. Five yards. Danny McManus back deep for Dartmouth. McManus fair catch at his own 10-yard line. Let's go back down to the field and check in with Carolyn Mano. Well, Paul, whether it's baseball or football, one of the things that I'm noticing down here from the sidelines is that the Fenway Park grounds crew is checking in for the evening. Dartmouth head coach Buddy Tevens told me just before a kick that the field is actually coming up just a little bit in certain spots. So the ground crew has been out here with every chance that they can, just patting down the field, making sure that it stays in good shape. It looks to be in good shape for the most part of Paul and Ross. There's just a couple places where it's starting to come up a little bit. All right, Carolyn, thank you. And as Ross and I mentioned, uh, yeah, most of it, like she said, was felt like it was pretty good, looked like it was pretty good in pregame, but all it takes is a couple of spots to come up like that. And good that the ground screw is right on top of it. Right up the middle on first down for a gain of two. And the Dartmouth offense trying to pick up where it left off. Last time we saw him with a possession here was 27-yard strike from Hennigan to Hagdorn. Hennigan right now, three for three. Senior quarterback with his numbers not quite as big as they were a year ago in terms of yards and completions, and that stone right up the middle to, to the 16-yard line. But he is better in a couple of very important categories, Ross. His completion percentage is now up over 60%. It was not a year ago. And his touchdown-to-interception ratio is among the best in the Ivy League. That's the big one. And their one loss total is better than it was last year, which is what means the most to him as a senior captain trying to get a piece of another championship here in Dartmouth. Trying to get a first down right now on third and four. Stands in and right down in front of us, catching it the second time is Emery Thompson. First down Dartmouth, 
gain of 19. Boy, these quarterbacks are both playing very, very well. To end the quarter, Hennigan just drops it into Thompson, bobbles a little bit, catches the back half of the football. He's just running the old flag pattern. You see the second time catches it, gets a foot down. You only need one in college. That is really well done. On a cold and windy night, Jack Hennigan. Talked to him before the game. He was calm, said the weather and the wind not going to bother him. He's yet to throw an incompletion. Look, well, Carolyn waving from the <laughs> green monster there earlier. That touchdown pass from Hennigan to Hagdorn. The difference so far, Dartmouth leads by six after one. Well, it's the Hennigan-Hagdorn connection that has the big green up 6-0 after a quarter. Stay tuned. Plenty more to come from Fenway Park on the Woods Watch Party. Make your debit card green. Big green. Select from 16 options by visiting any Ledyard Bank location or calling 888-746-4562. Ledyard's online and mobile banking includes free personal mobile check deposit so you can show all your Dartmouth pride on your home turf. Equal housing lender, member FDIC. Hi, I'm Pierre LeBlanc, president of Engelberth Construction. For over 40 years, we've been recognized as one of the largest and most dynamic commercial construction companies in northern New England. As a premier builder and partner of Dartmouth Athletics, we have built many facilities on campus. And at Engelberth Construction, we truly believe in building relationships for life. Go Big Green. After a 19-yard pitch and catch to Emery Thompson, it's a fresh set of downs for the Big Green to begin the second quarter, and they're driving. Welcome back to Fenway Park. I'm here with Jack Hayes, Director of Athletics for Brown. How did this event come to be? Yeah, Fenway approached us, and you know, it's such a historic place, and the opportunity to play a football game in a non-traditional football setting was something we were very excited about, and uh, it's been great for our team. It's been great for uh, the alumni community. It's really been a great opportunity for Brown overall. What's some of the feedback that you've gotten from the fans? There are a lot of fans in attendance here, even though it is cold. So many people braving the temperatures. I'm sure they're just so excited. Think, yeah, it is cold, but I, I think people know that these are the kind of things that they don't come around that often, and people wanted to be a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. It's been a great night so far, and I'm sure Paul, it'll only get better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolyn, and uh, for the Dartmouth offense, it started very well in that first quarter. The quarterback, Jack Hennigan, hasn't thrown in a completion. He's been sharing time right there with number 13, Jared Gerbino. Both quarterbacks under the conditions have been pretty impressive. Hennigan right now, four out of four. Go ahead, make it five out of five. And that is his backup quarterback who's taking snaps here tonight. Jared Gerbino hanging on. First down, Dartmouth. Well, Gerbino looks like a tight end, and he's got that big body. Takes a lick after he makes the catch, but just shows even more versatility. His ability to run a route out of the slot wasn't the best run route ever, but he's got the size and athleticism to make it pay off for the big green big athlete 6'4 230 played soccer hoops baseball obviously football growing up and vito penza keeping his quarterback perfect digging that one out at the 49 yard line top of the green monster there good place to watch baseball or football It's just so cool, unique, and different to see a football game here. Everything about, I mean, look, look at the scoreboard bottom left. You see quarterback 11, quarterback 16, where the pitcher usually is. <laughs> I hope Hennigan and Linta both got pictures of that. Hennigan in rhythm. Across the 40-yard line for another Dartmouth first down. Well, and he's in rhythm, Paul, because he has as much time as he wants to throw it. Brown's going to have to come with pressure or some type of blitz because... Their straight rush, including Richard Jarvis, is just not getting there. Hennigan during the week telling us uh, going from year one to year two as a starter, this is his second year. Empty backfield now. Much better at recognizing coverages. You can see that in the moment. Look at that. Coming underneath to a wide-open Hunter Hagdorn. 
to the 31-yard line. Penalty marker across the field on the 33-yard line. It was a unique formation by Dartmouth. They actually split out the left tackle, Kyle Kasky. The officials are going to talk about this one. Usually when you have a unique formation like that, you alert the officials. That was the receiver downfield. Number 89 of the offense was covered. It's a five-yard penalty. Repeat first down. So the officials were just talking to Buddy Tevens right there because when you have any type of exotic like that, you check with the officials beforehand so that they're ready for it. It seems to me like Kyle Kasky, the left tackle who was split out, needed to be off the ball. He was covering up the tight end number 89, Steven Johnston. Dartmouth coming in, snapping a two-game losing streak last week with a 10-0 shutout of Cornell. It's Ryder Stone up to the 40-yard line. And the Big Green just one game behind Yale right now. One of four teams at 3-2 and two in the Ivy League with two games left. Only two teams truly control their destiny. Yale, who can win at least a piece of the championship by beating Princeton tomorrow, and Harvard because Harvard's 3-2 and two as well, and of course they play Yale in the game next Saturday, which we will televise on CNBC. Blitz coming for Brown is picked up. Hennigan stands in. Wanted Hunter Hagdorn, but overshot him. A nice job by Ryder Stone of picking up the blitz there and giving Hennigan an extra moment of time to throw that one. And good coverage there by Terrell Smith, 28. He's got Hagdorn in the slot. Really was stride for stride with him there, and he had Coglin the deep safety, helping him over the top. That's well done by Smith. Third down and 12, obvious passing situation. Ross, you mentioned you want to see him get after the quarterback a little more and see if they can do it here. Blitz comes, but they don't get to him. Estrada, excellent catch at the 20-yard line. They brought the blitz, Paul. You called it, but a good job by Stone to stone the linebacker. And Estrada, he's not a big guy, he goes up and stares the ball out of the air. Coglin, the safety, was coming over and wanted to make a play on the ball, but Estrada beat him to it. Drew Estrada, excellent catch there, and Dartmouth last in the Ivy League. Third down conversions, comes up with a big one on third and long. Jared Gerbino checks into the game, keeps it himself, and that's 6'4", 230 coming at you, down to the 10-yard line. This is an inside counter scheme where you pull the right guard to the left. That was wide open. It's such a high tendency for Dartmouth to run Gerbino when he's in the game that if you're Brown, that's what you have to try to stop first. If he hands it off, that's secondary, because so often Gerbino takes it himself. Heading it back in. Ryder Stone cuts it back inside the five. Touchdown, Dartmouth. The inside zone concept with the fullback Penza coming back and kicking out, and frankly, that's poor tackling by Brown. There's a couple different places right there, and again right there, where you got to bring down Ryder Stone. Credit Stone for the nice move and breaking a tackle, but that's poor tackling by the Brown Bears. See if David Smith can make his first extra point of the night. Had the first one blocked. Now he's one for two, and now the Big Green leads 13 to nothing. So for Dartmouth, it's top receiver Hunter Hagdorn has a touchdown catch, and the top runner, Ryder Stone, thanks to that play right there, has a touchdown run. Early in the second, the Big Green by 13. Let's take a look at that scoring drive, and it started, Paul, with a terrific blitz pickup by the running back, Ryder Stone. If defense is going to blitz, you got to make them pay. He stoned him in the hole, and Estrada climbed the ladder to make that catch. Then Gerbino, the Wildcat quarterback, came in for big yardage, and then Stone got to pay it off with a touchdown, which he deserved after that blitz pickup earlier in the series. Celebrate Fenway Park knocking it out of the park with a touchdown run there and 
Dartmouth knocking it out on third down. We've talked about how much they've struggled on third down. Worst team in the Ivy League coming into this game, but they're four out of five on third down. A couple big conversions on that drive, and the blocking, the blitz pickup from Ryder Stone had a lot to do with it. That was the major thing that Buddy Tevens, the Dartmouth head coach, talked to us about this week. He said, offensively, we're running it pretty well, playing very solid defensively. We just can't convert on third down. That has not been a problem so far tonight, and they've been doing it third and real long after they put themselves in some bad positions with penalties. See the Fenway Gridiron Series there in the middle of the field. You also saw it hanging from the Green Monster. UMass and Maine will play tomorrow. UConn and BC are going to play next week. And there are also three high school games. Local Boston High School is playing on Thanksgiving weekend. That makes up the Fenway Gridiron Series. Brown special teams put them in good position. However, penalty flag is down. That's Isaac Whitney bringing it back. Penalty marker, though, back on the 27-yard line. During the return, holding number 22. Half the distance to the goal. First down. Brings back a nice return from Whitney. And the Brown offense now. You can see it right there in the middle of the screen. And he knew it right away. He looked at the official and Sam Russell knew they were going to call that. Tough break for Brown as they would have had excellent field position. Now they got to start on their own eight-yard line. First down and ten, trying to respond. Down 13-0. Pat Dorn with a touchdown reception and Stone with a touchdown run for Dartmouth. Quick pitch outside. And Dartmouth front four once again in the backfield of Brown to make a play. Just so solid and physical up front across the board look at the numbers last week against cornell 52 rushing yards allowed on 34 carries those 12 first downs allowed four of them were on the last drive after dartmouth went up 10 nothing you look at all of dartmouth numbers that define their season so far statistically ross the only ones that really stand out and are high nationally in the ivy league we're looking at rush offense and also rush defense Excellent job last week against Cornell. Empty backfield now, three wideouts to the left. Flag comes in just before the snap. Delay of game. Number 60 on the offense. Five yard penalty. Second down. So you have the penalty on the kickoff return. Five yard delay a game. And now you're inside your own five yard line. Makes it very, very difficult, especially when the team you're playing, frankly, is more talented than you are. The most success they've had tonight has been out of these empty sets when Linta has either gotten the ball out of his hands quickly or faked the quick screen and thrown it a little bit further down the field. Dartmouth only bringing three. And Linta gets a little back. With the completion there to LJ Harriet. Pick up a five yards. The good thing about going against a Dartmouth defense coached by Don Dobes is so often they're going to be in zone coverage. They play a lot of vanilla zone coverage defensively, so you know that. What makes it tough is on these third and longs, it's tough because they're going to sit back there, let you catch it in front of them, and then rally the ball and make the tackle. Only one out of four converting third downs. It's been third and long like this third down and eight. Nearly intercepted, and it should have been intercepted that's Colin Boyce and this is the thing if you try to force the ball down the field against these zones they're gonna be there because they're dropping back in zone coverage they have two deep safeties that just have their eye on the quarterback and they're taking care of their side of the field and Boyd got a great jump on that one be thinking about that one for a while Danny McManus back to receive low kick Comes right to him at the 50-yard line, and he's dropped at the 48. 
Bottom of 40 yards, and Dartmouth will begin inside of Brown territory. Buddy Tevens, a head coach at Dartmouth, near and dear to his heart, former quarterback here, and led the Big Green to an Ivy League title back in 1978. First was a head coach here from 87 to 91 before he left. And he came back. Well, he was an Ivy League champion first, but he came back in 2005, was a head coach at Tulane and also Stanford. In those first five seasons he came back, Ross, didn't have a single winning season. But ever since, he's only had one losing season. Well, they've made a big commitment to being better at football at Dartmouth. They've got a brand new facility, which is amazing. And they've made significant improvements to the stadium as well. It's Miles Smith across the left side for a gain of three. Stevens also played hockey at Dartmouth. Maybe that's why he's not wearing gloves or anything on his head. <laughs> he's a hockey player. Tough he's tough. Guy. He's tough. Look at him. Does look a little cold, though. Can, can you imagine playing both football and hockey right? in high school, in college, I mean, at the Division I level? Unheard of now. Play action. And that'll be two yards short of a Dartmouth first down. And that's Emory Thompson with his second catch of the night. So you saw how long Tevens has been at it at Dartmouth, both as a quarterback and now in his second stint as a head coach. Said he's never had a season like this with six games decided by five points or less. He said his guys are pretty much used to it. Seems like every game comes down to the very end. Third down and two. They're four out of five in this situation. Quick rollout to the right, and that's really the first misfire from Hennigan. And one in Vino Penza. So you're fourth down and two coming up. You're up 13. I was going to ask if you go for it, but I see the punt team hustling onto the field. No, I wouldn't go for it. You know, Brown is really struggling to move the football. The strength of your team is the defense. You can pin them very deep. And the way things have gone so far in this game, you're up 13. It's unlikely that Brown's going to be able to drive the length of the field against your D. Scott Boylan back to receive for Brown. Heels on his own nine-yard line. Called for the fair catch, but never got to it. And the ball rolls dead. On the 16-yard line. Brown offense trailing by 13. We'll try to cut into that big green lead when we come back to Fenway Park. College football on NBCSN is brought to you by TIAA. Let's plan for your success at TIAA.org. And by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Welcome back to Fenway Park. Paul Burmeister, Ross Tucker, Carolyn Mano. Ivy League battle between Dartmouth and Brown of a lot of significance to Dartmouth. You see where they are. Three and two tied for second with Columbia, Harvard, and Cornell. One game behind Yale. Yale plays Princeton tomorrow, and then we'll be at the big one, the game, next week in New Haven for Yale and Harvard. Pretty unbelievable that Harvard controls their destiny as well, Paul. And a little jet sweep, a reverse for Brown. Picks him up a first down on their first play of this possession. So back to the Ivy League standings and advancing it. There could be a seven-way <laughs> tie. Every single team in the Ivy League can think about the championship besides Brown. Oh, man. Somebody much smarter than me can probably do the odds of that actually happening. I'll just tell you it's very small that all of that happened. I mean, it's conceivable. It could happen. But that's not going to happen. Seven-way tie. <laughs> well, for the, for the thought of a seven-way tie to continue into the weekend, Dartmouth has to win here tonight. It would be surprising if Yale lost their last two games. They seem to have the best team in the league this year. The last reception there for Brown was Jacob Prawl. Brings up second down and four. Down in his own backfield. And Jack Trainer making another play for the Dartmouth defense. He is really impressive. Trainers from Chicago, you see him, he identifies it and just hits it right now. Now, if you're a linebacker and you see it go, Lake Forest, Illinois, he's only a junior, 
But you can see he puts the time in during the week. As soon as he saw that right guard pull, he replaced him. He went right where that right guard was and flew in there to make the tackle for loss. Big play coming up here for the Brown offense. Third and six, trailing by 13. Need to get something going, and that's how you do it. Jacob Crawl inside Big Green territory, all the way down to the 26-yard line. Brown offense responds on third down and six. Linta stepped into that throw knowing he was going to take a shot. How about the stop start there by Prawl? As soon as he caught that, he went back, watch this, catches it right back the other way. Wow. I mean, that is not easy to do. That's a big time cut. Gain of 39, and Linta picks up the air and snap and makes a play. Wow. <laughs> Jalen Blandberg. Hauls it in, your routine 14-yard reception on first down. Well, it was a two-hopper to second base, and Linta was able to turn two right there by throwing <laughs> the ball to Blamberg. I love it. That's right around where second base is, too. I was going to say, Ross, I think he was right about at second yeah, base. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Depending on whatever shift was called. That was the Red Sox magic right there. Very well done, Dustin Pregoria, if he's watching... Appreciated that reference there, Ross. And the throw from his territory. Ground offense back to the ground, down to the 10-yard line. Gain of two yards. Boy, it would be huge, Paul, if Brown is able to get a touchdown here. Yeah, they have not had much success this year offensively. And they get a touchdown before the half to get within one score get them right back in this game would be huge it's been a game dominated so far by dartmouth and just in these last few plays the brown offense showing up 39 yard completion on third down and six and here they are at the 10 yard line linta off his back foot to the end zone well out of the end zone, off that screen to protect you against foul balls. <laughs> and Aaron throws on second down. That'll bring up third down and eight. One of the things that's interesting here is just where the fans are. You know, where they bought the tickets. A lot on the first baseline, a lot on the third baseline. Not a whole lot behind the end zone, which is behind home plate. Even right field, there's a lot of people in right field. Head down into the area, Ross, of Fenway Park, where most of the fans are there, which would be third base down to, to home plate. Third down and eight coming up. Linta again off his back foot and incomplete to his top receiver, Jacob Prawl. A little late to get him the ball. Linta probably should have put that on Prawl earlier, although it's unlikely Prawl would have been able to get the first down anyway. Because Dartmouth dropped into that zone. He was actually running a crossing route in front of those linebackers. So they'd converge to be able to step up and make the tackle short of the line to gain. So fourth and eight with Linta holding Ben Rosenblatt comes in to attempt a field goal. Only one out of four so far this season. His only make is from inside of 19 yards. So no field goals made from the 20 and beyond. And from 27 yards out, knocks it through. So the senior on senior night at Fenway Park puts his team on the board, and now Brown is down by 10. Linta to Prawl, setting up the first points for Brown. It's 13-3 in the second quarter. Thirteen to three here at Fenway Park. Dartmouth on top of Brown by ten points. Updated weather. We told you it was cold. Those fans right there would tell you it's very cold. Temperature in the mid twenties. A lot of wind. Wind chill makes it feel like it's twelve degrees. You can use that blanket up here, Ross. As we are outdoors here this evening. We are very, very impressed by the fans. She's got the right idea. <laughs> Cover the face up as much as you can. That's right. Get some warm liquids in you. It's all about the feet and hands. You know, Paul, it's all about the feet and hands. It's true. That's why I'm wearing boots and wondering why you're wearing tennis shoes. <laughs> I got double socks on. I got double socks. Oh. 
For more on the weather, let's go down to the field and say hello to Carolyn. Well, Paul and Ross, I think you guys are okay up there with your double <laughs> socks. Down here, we are feeling the effects of the temperatures dropping just a little bit, but these are Ivy Leaguers. They're very smart. They realize that circulation is very important. So basically, we have what equates to four campfires set up down here. It's an interesting sideline to begin with, with everybody so close together, but you'll see just groups of players, and everybody is huddled around this amazing heat-making device. Ross, I know you're familiar with what these are actually called. All I know is I am not leaving this thing anytime soon. We, we just call them hot dog heaters. I don't know if that, I, I'm pretty sure that's not the technical term, but that's what we call them, hot dog heaters. Jared Gervino drops that one, and Carolyn's got things figured out. One of her reports, she was actually indoors. <laughs> her next one, she's down there next to a heater. And you know what's funny, Paul, is that when you're starting, you're not that cold because you're out there running around. There's so much adrenaline. You're more worried about the guy right across from you than you are the weather. It's when you're a backup. It's when oh, you're on the sidelines. That's when it's cold. Awfully cold down there. Nine for 12 and now nine for 13 with an interception is Jack Hennigan. Jorquel Condomina. Picks off Hennigan. Yeah, what a job by him, by Condamina. They're in a cover two coverage there. And Hennigan's trying to fit the ball into that window between the corner and the safety we talked about earlier. But Condamina drops off because he read Hennigan's eyes, didn't think he was going to throw the ball to Hagdorn in the flat. That's well done. And swinging for the fences is the celebration of the night for good reason. <laughs> Well, Hennigan came into that drive, 9 for 11, only two incompletions, and had two incompletions there. Really the drop by Gerbino and the nice play by Condomina. So the Brown offense put together a drive last time it had it, and did three points. Now they'll get to start on the Dartmouth 38-yard line. A lot of times after a play like that, a turnover, you like to take a shot, but Dartmouth plays those two deep safeties in zone so often makes it very difficult. And Alinsa dropped as he went to fire that one. And that was one thing I really noticed watching the Yale game last week was how often Linta ended up on his back. Those play action passes, especially last week against Yale, by the time he turned his head around, he was getting smashed. They've gone away from that for the most part tonight. But that time they wanted to take a shot deep. They had the same idea that we did, Paul. But Dartmouth was all over it, so Linta had to try to come back down to the check down he was just too late to do it brings up second down and ten back to the air and under throws at that time and for good reason because that one was nearly intercepted again it just felt like Linta was a little late to get the ball where he wanted to go it's tough to know exactly what his progression is and what he's being asked by Offensive coordinator Frank Sheehan to read, but he did not come back to that till it was too late. But two incompletions, drive that started with so much excitement for Brown after the interception. Now they have third down and ten. Coming right underneath, and that's the first down, Brown. Darius Day's starting tailback caught it well short. Of the marker but turns that one into a first down and picks up 15. Dartmouth almost gave him that and it said you know what we'll make the tackle but he makes Miley miss in space and then finishes the run by getting some extra yards running into Colin Boyd. Nice job by the true freshman running back. He's from St. Louis. Had a big game earlier in the year against Rhode Island. They won that game. He had 95 yards on 16 carries and two touchdowns. Brown going back to that empty set. Good job right there by Linton, not forcing it on third and ten, taking what they gave him and letting his running back do the rest. Fires incomplete, and once again, Ross, Linton was just drilled right as he let it go. You could see that one coming. We know they want to get the ball to Harriet more, but when he came flying around the end there, as you see Linton come off, Coach Estes told us there would be times where Harriet would play quarterback. Hasn't happened a lot this year. We'll see if Dartmouth's ready for it. They do it with Gerbino. Now Brown's doing it with Harriet. He can throw the ball. Former quarterback. 
Already with a key third down conversion with the reception earlier tonight, second down and 10. And he's dropped right away. The Dartmouth defense, not surprised, Jake Moan. Boy, that's so good by Moan. He comes flying in and expecting Harriet to keep the ball. You know, they got Harriet at quarterback. There's usually a reason for it. And Harriet's trying to read Moan. Moan did a nice job of looking like he was going to go for the running back and in the last second changing his angle so he could go right for Harriet. That was awesome. Loss is six. And what did their coaches tell us during the week about, we asked them, how has the defense grown? He said they're smarter. Just like you said, they recognized the quarterback coming in there. He wanted to run. And they were on him right away, or at least Jake Moan was. Third down and 16. Minta back in and again rushed. Wanted to set up the screen. Nothing there. And the Dartmouth defense stepping up to make up for the interception a few moments ago. Should be four down territory. They tried to get Days on the screen. Days took too long, though, blocking a Dartmouth defender. If you're a running back, if you can get a block early and then leak out, go. Otherwise, you got to get out. Quarterback needs somebody to be able to throw the ball to. Linton did the right thing there to just eat it. Now on fourth and 16, he's going to have to drive the ball down the field. Whether it's interception or not, he doesn't have a choice. Although they did pick up the third down and 10 a couple of plays ago just by dropping it off to the tailback Darius Days. A little different here on 4th and 16. Tries to drop it off again, this time to a tight end. And Anton Casey nowhere near a first down. Hard to understand that. You know, on 3rd down and 10, okay, if you don't get it, then you can go for it on 4th down. But on 4th and 16, to throw it short of the yard to gain like that to a tight end, I mean, you have almost no shot of him being able to get the first down. Dartmouth defense picking up picking up the offense heading in through the interception Brown took over and Dartmouth territory Ryder Stone right up the middle clock ticking now with three minutes tackle made by Richard Jarvis Right on top of the dugout and join a Friday night at Fenway Park. How cool is that? You come to a major league ballpark, you're sitting on the dugout, your team right in front of you. And if your team's Dartmouth, they're on top 13 to 3. Ryder Stone, second consecutive play, right up the middle. You and I were surprised, Paul, just by how uncomfortable the bullpen looks like. It looks like it hasn't changed <laughs> since 1912. They started playing here in 1912. I mean, I don't know how much different it would have looked. Just no, I mean, that, that would be a rough place to sit. It's just to the right of that shot there is where the, where the bullpen is. Third down and four. Here comes the blitz. Hennigan stands in, and Estrada, the top receiver tonight, has tough yards for a first down. Strong hands. He has been impressive. Remember earlier he went up and caught that ball in the air. This time, watch how strong his hands are. Because Condamina was all over him. Condamina's been good in coverage. Estrada just has those strong, a strong grip. It's the second one of his four catches to go for a first on third down. Hennigan going to keep it himself. Picks up a nice block from his wide receiver. Emory Thompson. See Hennigan again. He has a 3-8 GPA in econ. Very, very bright young man. But he told us he's going to make every effort he can to try to play football professionally somehow, some way. Picked up six there in the run. Dumps it off to Ryder Stone. Another smart play. First down, Dartmouth. Clock ticking now inside of 130. Stops there with the move of the chains. Gain of seven yards. This is when you like having a veteran senior quarterback to run the two-minute drill like this. Look at that pocket he steps up into. That's Hunter Hagdorn, and that's a big game for Dartmouth. 
Great patience inside the pocket from Hennigan. He had all kinds of time and just floated the ball out there to a wide open Hagdorn. Brown really lucky that they even made the tackle there. Hagdorn almost took this to the house after that spin move. 38 yards to Hagdorn, right back across the middle. Touchdown, Hagdorn, wow. his second tonight. And once again, Paul, it was just that skinny post. He's not coming at a real hard slant. He just runs down the field, down the seam, and just breaks his route off a little bit. Let's see if he does the swing for the fences again. Back-to-back -back receptions for Hagdorn, the second one. The second score tonight. You'll see Hagdorn to the right in the slot, and once again, right there he is in the slot. He's going against that zone coverage. Hennigan knows he's going to be in between the corner and the safety. That's the soft spot against a cover three zone. In those two seams in between them, Hennigan puts it right on him. See his eyes go to the left right at the top of his drop there, just enough to create that wide gap in the middle. He held Coggle in the safety just enough. And Hagdorn, you see him there, number one from outside of Houston, Texas. He's been playing all year with a high ankle sprain. Buddy Teven says he's just tough. He's Texas tough. And that's exactly how you would expect your senior quarterback, Jack Hennigan, to come back and respond. Remember the possession before he threw the interception. And played big there, a nice run. Different kinds of throws. He checked one down to Ryder Stone. 38-yard post to Hagdorn, then the strike to Hagdorn in the end zone. Deep to receive here for Brown, Scott Boylan, number 81, and also Isaac Whitney. This is Whitney, tackled at the 25-yard line. Penalty marker on the 21-yard line. During the return, illegal block in the back, number 80 of the return team. 10-yard penalty will be first down. Coming up on the Geico Halftime Report, we'll check in with Pro Football Talk, NASCAR America update, and also highlights and stats. We'll send you from Fenway Park here back to the studio. Broncos Patriots. Good Sunday, Sunday night. nights. Osweiler again. Remember a couple years ago in the snow? I think he won that game, didn't he? He did. They yeah. did. The Broncos won that game on their way to winning a little thing called the Super Bowl. They probably would not have won the Super Bowl. They didn't win that game that night, by the way. Osweiler played well down the stretch. Some big throws. Another penalty marker down. Boy, that's rough. I mean, Brown's really just trying to run the clock out here. Holding on the offense, number 63. Half the distance to the goal line. Repeat the down. Timeout. Charge to Dartmouth. To be their first timeout of the half. Dartmouth now with two timeouts left. And uh, see, they're thinking, love to get the ball back with the offense hot. Coming up Sunday in Phoenix, five drivers, including seven-time champion Jimmy Johnson, will be racing to earn just one remaining spot in NASCAR's championship race. 2.30 Eastern on NBC. And they just clarified Buddy Tevens declined that penalty because it doesn't make sense to accept the penalty if you're going to call a timeout because then they would rerun first down. So that's the right decision to decline the penalty if you're trying to get the ball back here in the first half. Good look at the layout here as it sets up for football at Fenway Park. Been playing here since 1912. These two teams played in 1922 and 23. Think about the guys that played here. 
like Ty Cobb, right? Babe Ruth. Are you kidding me? How good is that? Ted Williams, perhaps the best hitter of all time. Good guy to mention on Veterans Day, too. There you go. That's why we bring you along. It, it all ties in together. It all ties in together, Paul. I was surprised to read as I got ready for the week how much football they played here. Patriots played here in the 60s. Boston College played dozens of times here. Up through the 50s and 60s. They had about a 50-yard uh, break, 50-year break, before it came back here in 2015 with BC and Notre Dame play. And the Dartmouth front four been a story all night. Once again making a play in the Brown backfield. And another timeout called by Dartmouth. Nice job by Eric Miley. These two linebackers, Miley's from North Jersey. He played at Don Bosco Prep, which is one of those North Jersey powerhouse programs. They are just so good, so well coached, as typically Dartmouth linebackers are by their head, by their defensive coordinator, Don Dobes. Time out of the football field. Let's uh, talk a little more baseball. There's Ted Williams. See that one just outside the stadium. Can't tell you, Paul, how often my grandfather would talk about him. You know, my grandfather served in World War II, had tremendous amount of respect for Ted Williams. A lot of history, a lot of great players. You can see from all those numbers. Retired here at Fenway Park. The red seat you can see right there is supposedly where Ted Williams hit the longest home run ever hit. Wow. And that, I'm looking at it right now. That is way up there in right field. So on third down now, Linta comes underneath. And another penalty marker comes out. Catch made by Jalen Blandberg. So there's a look at the red seat. Ted Williams hit it with a home run. That's awesome. You think right that's, field. You, you think can it's more expensive <laughs> to get that seat? I want the Williams seat. It's more meaningful to sit there. As we pull back, you can see how deep that is. Oh, my goodness. In right field. Big Pop, he said. Downfield. On the offense, number 80 was covered. That penalty would be declined. And David Ortiz said Four it's down. impossible. <laughs> impossible to hit, to hit a ball that far. Well, he would know, I guess. <laughs> but I don't think that they would make it up and put it there. Take that, take that juiced ball. Right? You know, all the talk during the World Series about the juiced ball. Ted Williams did that before anybody or anything was juiced. Got another timeout. All right, let's take a look now and see where else some deep home runs were hit. Just kidding, Ross. <laughs> see the rest of the Ivy League games coming up here for the next... Uh, next eight days, really. And a lot of good ones tomorrow. I mean, all, every game tomorrow is very meaningful, which is really cool. You know, there's no tiebreakers, Paul, in the Ivy League. If four teams tie all having a 5-2 and two record, then it's a four-way tie for first. And I love the fact that it's a true round robin. Every team plays the other. Yes. Game. Yep. And then, obviously, next weekend, Harvard at Yale will be the big one. It always is the game on CNBC. You know, it's also really fun if you don't have a single rooting interest in the in the Ivy League that it's kind of turned upside down. The teams yes. are toward the top this year were at the bottom last year. Good for those guys for turning around. Columbia, Cornell, this Dartmouth team. So you don't want to touch the ball here if you're Brown. You let it go because you want to take as much time off the clock as possible. It's one of the things you're taught in the NFL. Don't pick it up. Make the ref have to blow it dead. Take some more seconds off of it. So using timeouts, playing good defense. Dartmouth getting the ball back. 20 seconds left, up 20 to 3. And why did they so much want it back up 17 on the cold, windy night? Well, their quarterback is 13 out of 17. It's Jack Hennigan, a couple of touchdown passes. Both of them going to his top wide receiver, number one, Hunter Hagdorn. See if he can get a little more going now. 20 seconds left. No timeouts remaining. Comes back underneath. This is his running back, Ryder Stone. First down. Down to the 34-yard line. Of course, this being college football, Paul, 
The clock stops until the chains are set. And again, quickly, and just like that, Dartmouth is down to the 10-yard line. It's Dylan Miller with the reception there. Three seconds remaining. That is so well done by Dartmouth across the board. Getting the stop on defense, using your timeouts, good blitz pickup by Stone, and once again, that seam is open. That same pattern. It's Dylan Meller with his first catch tonight. You go through quick situations on a Thursday practice, Ross, it doesn't go much better than that. No. Wow. Hit Ryder Stone, you hit Meller. You got a 28-yard field goal attempt. And it is up and in textbook. Dartmouth goes up by 20 points. Use their timeouts, play some defense, lead on your senior quarterback for two completions, short field goal, points as you jog off the that, field. That reminds you of the Patriots, the team that we'll see on NBC Sunday night. Situational football trying to maximize every situation to your benefit. Carolyn Mano with Dartmouth head coach Buddy Tevens. Well, coach, I'll let you get inside because I know you're absolutely freezing, but good execution there at the end of the half. How satisfied are you with the way the first half went? Well, we gave that, that one big drive. I'd also that we're pull, pushing the ball down the field pretty well and we're tackling their guys, so, so far so good. And what will you be telling your guys at halftime in terms of where to improve? Uh, just keep pushing. Going to play good defense, control the ball offensively, and run the ball a little bit more, but uh, so far, so good. All right. Thanks, Coach. Great, thanks. Paul? All right. Maybe run it a little more. Jack Hannigan has led the way on offense, the quarterback for Dartmouth. He's 15 out of 20 through two quarters, 223 and a couple of touchdowns. Efficient night on any evening, but especially with the temperature in the 20s and the wind whipping around 20 miles per hour. You see the players now spilling into their respective dugouts. Dartmouth into the visitor's side. And Brown into the Red Sox clubhouse. It's halftime, and Dartmouth is in control at Fenway Park. We've reached halftime at Fenway Park. Now, the previous week, Dartmouth shut out Cornell 10-0. The defense is still there. But here today, it's the offense that has stolen the show. 23 points after two quarters. We'll see you in the third. Domino's knows a thing or two about delivery. So when we saw people were getting tacos and burgers delivered like these, we had to step in. Introducing our new chicken taco and cheeseburger pizzas. What? Oh, my. Now the best way to get a taco or burger delivered is to get a Domino's pizza. Hi, I'm Chelsea from WISE. I'm at home practicing social distancing just like all of you. For almost 50 years, WISE has supported survivors in times of stress and crisis. Even during these unusual and uncertain times, we are still here for you and your loved ones. On those inevitably hard days or moments when you're not feeling particularly strong, we are here for you every hour, every day. While it feels like everything in our world has come to a halt, Violence doesn't stop just because there's a virus. Call 866-348-9473 and to chat with us online, visit our website, wiseuv.org. Call 866-348-9473. You are not alone and you don't have to be in a crisis to call. Halftime is over. We are set for quarter number three as Dartmouth looks to pad the lead against Brown. Football at Fenway will continue here with the third quarter. The Dartmouth Big Green coming out of the visitors clubhouse here at Fenway down the third base side, down the first base side. It's Brown. They're using the Red Sox clubhouse. They go down the stairs. They walk down about a 20-yard alley to get to that point just underneath the press box at Fenway Park. We are down the third baseline, about 20 yards from the pesky pole. Down the right field line, Fenway been home to the Red Sox for 105 years. College football here at Fenway. First of six games here in November. Let's go to the sidelines. The third member of our team is Carolyn Mano. 
here with Brown head coach Phil Essis. And coach, what defensive adjustments are you going to make in the second half? Well, uh, it starts with everyone. Uh, we, we're just making some assignment errors out there. You know, we got to finish some of those tackles. And we've got to do a better job offensively. I think one of those things is we've got to stop shooting ourselves in the foot. It's happened time and time again. So penalties have hurt us, and if we've got to clean things up. It's more about us than it is about Dartmouth. All right, Coach, thank you. All right, thank Paul? You. Carolyn, thank you very much. Uh, Ross, if it is indeed more about them than it is about Dartmouth, where do you think they have to get better here in the second half? Well, they need to possess the ball a little bit more offensively and convert some more of the third downs, obviously get some more points on the board. But they also need to figure out defensively what they're going to do to stop Dartmouth from continuously throwing those passes down the seam. I mean, it has been killing Brown. And really, the other thing I would say, as you see Buddy Tevens, the head coach for Dartmouth, Brown's got to get some pressure on Jack Hennigan, Paul. I mean, he had as much time as he wanted the entire first half to throw the ball. And it's impressive what he did, and you see the numbers there. But still... You can't let them have that much time. Uniform perfectly white after playing the first two quarters and quite a contrast uh, to his counterpart. T.J. Lint has been knocked around from start to finish, or at least he was throughout the first half. 75% completion. Did have the one interception, but responded with a scoring drive right after that. And also did an excellent job as he got the ball back. Less than a minute left, no timeouts. Two completions to set up the final field goal. From 28 yards out. Love, the, love that it has QB there. <laughs> How do they have a Q? How do they have a QB there at Fenway Park, you know? They found it somewhere. I love it. it looks like we've played uh, three everybody, or four innings there. Everybody that put this together deserves a lot of credit. They really do, Paul. The people here at Fenway Park, the Gridiron Series, the athletic departments for Brown and Dartmouth. Yeah, this is one of those things that those guys will remember forever. Gridiron Series will also include a game tomorrow between UMass and Maine, next weekend between UConn and BC, and a trio of high school games coming up Thanksgiving weekend. With as well as this field sets up for football and how much it adds to the pageantry of college football. It's amazing. It went away for like five decades before ND and BC brought it back in 2015. Yeah. I don't have a good explanation for that, you know? I think sometimes in life you just have to think, you know what? We should try it. It's kind of like <laughs> the Winter Classic, right? you know? I, mean, I know when I'm turning the channel and I see a Winter Classic game, I'm, I'm frozen. I need to watch that. It's just so truly cool and unique to see ice hockey outside in the stadium. Did you know coming into this you wanted to talk about the Winter Classic and say you were frozen? <laughs> and Dartmouth with a nice return there from Drew Estrada, the leading receiver in the first half. Ross brings up the Winter Classic, and we have this ready to roll. Look at that. January of 2010, the time lapse is setting up the rink there, and unlike the football, which goes from home plate out to the right field, you can see there it goes from third base to first base, and a sellout crowd there. So back to football, Jack Hennigan showed you his numbers, talked about his success, 15 out of 20. Starts out of the shotgun, we'll see if he's pressured more. Ryder Stone cuts it up and out to the 39-yard line. And Buddy Tevens told Carolyn just before he went into the clubhouse there after the second quarter, one thing we're going to do in the second half is run the ball a lot more and try and control that clock. Makes perfect sense to me from a couple different factors. The more you run it, you keep the clock moving. You shorten the game when you have a 20-point lead. Helps you win the game. Less of a chance of injury the shorter the game is. And they got another big one next week against Princeton, although this game's far from over. You know, Brown has not done a very good job scoring, and this is exactly one of the things that Dartmouth was hoping to avoid here. It looks like they have an offensive lineman that's down. And Stone picked up one, bring up third down and one. And that's Logan Winders, number 74, down on the turf for, for Dartmouth.
You never like seeing this. You'll see the back of Justin Call's leg right there. He gets rolled up on. Ugh. We'll check in on the injury when we come back to Fenway Park. Dartmouth leads by 20. Let's take a look at what happened to Dartmouth left guard Justin Call right there. They're going to run a stunt up front, Brownwell. And the double team, the center and the nose tackle, they go flying in the back of Call's right knee. You never like seeing that. You see Call walk off. He's already the backup left guard, filling in for one of the twins, John Kill Commons. So now Brown is down to their third string left guard, Zach Sammartino. Penalty marker came in, Ross, just before the snap of the ball. Offside. Defense, number 91. Five-yard penalty. Second down. Correction. First down. Yeah, I'd say that's offsides. <laughs> You know what, though? If you're going to be offsides, you might as well just keep going, right? <laughs> Don't stop. <laughs> I think it was the first time they tackled Hennigan <laughs> in the backfield. It's one way to do it. Brown now penalized six times for 41 yards. Empty backfield for Hennigan. First down, plenty of time once again. One of his worst throws of the night. I haven't seen much of that. Just threw it too low. He didn't put enough on it. That seems to be the issue for Hennigan. He hasn't had much of an issue completing over 70% of his passes, but when he does miss, it seems it's a little short. The ball just dies on him a little bit to get there. Highly efficient first half. What a great kid talking to him on the field before the game, too, you know? So poised and yeah. calm and mature. Right back to the air, steps up. Second incompletion in a row, wanted Hunter Hagdorn. He's, you know, Hennigan's the type of kid where if he was a doctor, I don't want him to be my doctor. If he gets into finance, I'd be cool with him handling my money. <laughs> you know, he just, you're like, all right, this, kid, he, this kid's impressive. He gets it. 3-8 GPA in econ. And he uses those virtual reality glasses from Striver. They say he's the number one guy in the country in terms of the amount of time he spends using that virtual reality platform. Third down and 10. And that's a completion, but it's going to be a couple of yards short of a first down. Dylan Meller with his second catch tonight picks up seven. Good job by Jay Williams. Sits back in zone coverage and he breaks right on the pass. That's what you want to do when it's third and long for the opposition. Williams back in the lineup after missing last week's game against Yale. So the Brown defense, after giving Dartmouth the first down by the five-yard penalty on third and short, comes up with a stop, and Scott Boylan back deep to receive. Fair catch from his own five-yard line. Well, Sunday night is football night. Tom Brady and the Patriots head to Denver to face Vaughn Miller and the Broncos defense on Sunday night football. Mike Tirico, Dan Patrick host football night in America, 7 o'clock Eastern, only on NBC. 41-yard punt, fair catch. Brown defense took care of business, and now the offense will have to come out and see what it can do on its first possession here of the second half. They threw the ball much better in the first half tonight than they did last week against Yale. Linta was getting some more time, liked the plan they had of getting the ball out of his hands quickly, and he was sharp. 13 out of 23 for 138. That's what Linta did in the first half. And it stays right up the middle. Injury update. Let's go to the sideline and check in with Carolyn. Having some audio issues with Carolyn. We'll check back in with her when we can. That was a gain of two to bring up second down eight. A 
Darius Days, the top tailback for Brown, only two yards in that first half. And there was a lot of that, Ross, right as he gets to the line of scrimmage or even before, met by the Dartmouth front. Dartmouth's defensive front is better than the Brown offensive line. It's really just that simple. And probably rightfully so. They're a senior, veteran-laden group. Most of them started last year. They rotate a lot of them. They usually play even better in the second half than they do in the first half. One of the things Coach Dobes, the defensive coordinator, told us during the week, our depth usually allows us to be even more efficient, more aggressive, and really run to the ball in the second half. Really talking about that depth on the defensive front where they play seven or eight guys every game. Third down, this one has a chance to pick up a first. His top receiver, Jacob Prawl, does pick up a first down. These are the type of plays where just keep running them. I mean, if they're going to let you do it, they're going to let you have those. Keep throwing them. Wide receiver screens, get the ball to Prawl and Harriet and Blandberg. Those are your playmakers. First down, so the second half getting off to a positive start here for Brown. The stop on defense now picking up a first. Still deep in their own territory, though. First and 10 from the 16. And that's Days, and that's been the theme. It continues the Dartmouth defense there to meet him. Let's go back to the sideline and check in with Carroll. Hey, Paul, just an update on Justin Call. Head coach Buddy Tevens just came over, and he told them that it was actually a high ankle sprain, although I'm sure they're going to do some further testing. They just brought the crutches out for him. They took off the shoe on his right foot and was massaging his foot and an ankle a little bit. Trainers asking him some questions, but I think at this point, his night may be done. Hey, Carolyn, thank you. Might want to cover up that foot. Oh, my goodness. goodness. Frostbite <laughs> will begin to kick in. Sometimes, though, after you have an injury, you know, it gets all numb on you. Third down and 10 for the Brown offense. The third down been an issue tonight. Four out of 11 so far for the Bears. Dartmouth brings five, picked off, and that'll be a pick six. Touchdown, Dartmouth. Jarius Brown putting six points on the board. Look at the left side of your screen. It looked like Jacob Prawl, the receiver for Brown, just fell down. And I'm not sure if George was able to just cut in front of him. We'll see. It. Take a look at it comes out of his break, falls down. Oh, I don't know that that would have made that much of a difference. Jarius Brown just read that all the way. That is high-level cornerback play. Yeah, Brown ran that route for the receiver. I mean, if Paul doesn't fall down, maybe he knocks the pass away, but Jarius Brown was all over that. 27-yard interception return for a touchdown. Third down and 10 turns into six points for Dartmouth. Brown, nothing but green in front of him. The big green rolling in a big way up 27. College football on NBCSN is brought to you by TIAA. Let's plan for your success at TIAA.org. And by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Dartmouth Big Green playing at Fenway Park. Making a statement. One game out of first place. Up now 30-3, to Jarius Brown. Moments ago with the 27-yard interception return. And the Big Green rolling here inside of Fenway Park. Tremendous job by Brown, as we showed. And I'm talking Jarius Brown, not the Brown Bears. <laughs> In case there's any confusion there, Jarius Brown, the corner for Dartmouth making that play. 
The offensive struggles, Ross, continue for Brown in their five-game losing streak, but outscored by over 100 points. And only with a field goal to show tonight. Isaac Whitney and Scott Boylan deep. And here comes Boylan. And wow. down goes Boylan on the eight-yard line. Take another look at the pick six. And look at the left side of your screen. Dartmouth caught a break here because Tompkins hits Linta in the head area as he's throwing the football. Tough to tell whether or not that affected the throw, but there should have been a penalty on Tompkins there. And what a play there. I mean, that is Darius George. That's impressive. Jarius Brown, a senior out of Lauder Hill, Florida. And now we'll see if Lindsay can finally get something going here. With his team trailing by 27 points. Days up the middle, out to the 12-yard line, gain a three. Hey, how have you seen this dart mid defense evolve, Ross? You go back two years ago. Conference championship then they lost 10 of 11 starters. They took a big step back last year. What do you see this year? They're not quite what they were in 2015, but they're close They have a bunch of guys that have been starting now for two years across the board You know, they lost everybody from that 15 team including a couple guys that got shots in the NFL It was tough to replace those guys last year. You would expect the step back that they had last year but they're almost right back where they were. Complete to Isaac Whitney. And interesting talking to Jeremiah Duche, one of the Dartmouth defensive captains during the week. And he, we asked him the difference between that 2015 team and this one. He said, on this team, you've got freshman, sophomore, junior, senior contributing. That was an upperclassman dominated group back in 15. That team was really, really impressive. Third down and three. Linta has a pocket to step into, but fires that one incomplete. It's probably a good thing he did, because there wasn't really anybody open. He was trying to throw the ball to Howard Strachan, but he was well covered. The uncharacteristic for Phil Estes' team to have this kind of season. He's been there 20 seasons. He's only had three that aren't winning seasons. Only three non-winning seasons, and now still looking for that first win in the Ivy League. Late flag comes in. To clarify that, three seasons that were losing seasons, there were some 500 seasons right. in there as well. Well, in 16 of his 19 years, they've been in the top half of the Ivy League, the eight-team exactly. Ivy League. That's really impressive. Delay a game by the kick returner. Running after he signaled for a fair catch unnecessarily. It's a five-yard penalty. First down, Dartmouth ball. Danny McManus, number two. One of the better punt returners in the country at the FCS level. He called for a fair catch, and then after he picked up the ball off the bounce, he thought maybe he'd get away with it. <laughs> As was pointed out, unnecessarily. It's not necessary to <laughs> run with the ball after you call for a fair it's catch. kind of funny that that penalty is a delay of game, isn't it? I mean, he didn't really delay the game all that much. Let's go, baby. Let's go, baby. A little bit. <laughs> Hennigan back into quarterback. See if he can continue his strong night. This is Hunter Hagdorn. Fumble. And the football's out. Fumble picked up by Brown. And the ball's out again, but they're going to rightfully say that he was down. It looked like it was Hoyt at first glance. Number 93, Michael Hoyt. Scooped it up, and Hennigan and Hagdorn couldn't get this reverse. Fumble right there. And there's Hoyt. The football came out, but ruled that Hoyt was down. Right side of your screen, Richard Jarvis added again. 
Led the Ivy League in tackles for loss and sacks last year, number 49. Haven't really called his game his name tonight. He was right back in there, and that was not what Dartmouth wanted to do with a 27-point lead. You see, Dartmouth just had envisioned a drive where they run the ball and take a lot of time off the clock. Instead, on the first play, they give it right back to Brown. Linton makes the dive and the reverse. All that for an incompletion. They wanted to go deep there. Second time today, the they've come off of a turnover and wanted to try to go for it all. But Dartmouth, that's the thing that Coach Dobes, their defensive coordinator, told us. They understand situations. They understand sudden change. And that teams like to try to go up top. Their safeties, Boone, Stratton, Colin Boyd, they were having nothing of it. Inten intended receiver there, Jalen Blandberg. That'll bring up second down 10. Fake the pitch, and Linza again just drilled. What tied for the headline is the front four stopping the run, and the front four just dominating the passing game here. Well, and you're putting him in a bad spot right there. I mean, this that was reminiscent of the Yale game last year, and you see him reaching across his body there. He proved his toughness to me last week, that's for sure. With all the hits he took from Yale, that was another rough one right there. And a lot of them look just like that, Paul, where we're some type of play action, and they have his back totally turned to the defense, and by the time he whips his head around, there's a defender there ready to rock him. Third down. That time had a pocket, but the ball's knocked away. Ball's incomplete on third down and ten. Jacob Brawl is top receiver. It was who we wanted. Talked to Prawl before the game. Grew up in Dayton. He's a Red Sox. I'm sorry, a Cincinnati Reds fan. But he said he's a Browns fan from Dayton. He said, how'd that happen? He said, I don't know. All my family <laughs> members are, are Browns fans. Tough thing to be right now. Not like it was in the Ross Tucker era. Cleveland Browns. <laughs> 39-yard field goal attempt, Ben Rosenblatt. Pulls that one, and the score will remain 30-3. to three. Brown defense handed the Bear offense a very good opportunity there. Got to get points there if you're Brown. Rosenblatt's an interesting story. He actually transferred to Brown from Trinity, Division Three. You don't see that very often. Here's what we're looking at in the Ivy League. Dartmouth, one game behind Yale, along with Columbia, Harvard, and Cornell. On its way to bumping that record up to 4-2. and two. They can sit back and watch the action tomorrow. Ross says the Yale-Princeton game is an awfully big game. You can say the same thing about Columbia and Cornell. Yeah, they all are. And Harvard's it, it's pretty big, too. Yeah, I mean, Penn-Harvard here in Boston. What a great weekend for college football here in Boston. You can go to the Penn Harvard tomorrow, or you can come here again for Maine UMass. Jack Hannigan has been a star tonight. 16 out of 22, couple of touchdowns. And the direct snap that time. To his running back, Ryder Stone. Top back on this team. Ryder Stone sounds like he should be an actor when he's done. Doesn't that sound like an awesome name for an actor? It's not bad for a running back either. No, it's great. And more Ryder Stone. And he's got the physique for it, too. He could be the next action hero. <laughs> he got the future planned out for him. Yeah, I mean, look at him. He's got the, he's got the guns. Some pretty good stats here, too. Fast and Furious 17. Starring Ryder Stone. I think he may be getting in touch with you after the game, Ross. <laughs> Third down and one, and going to the air. The back shoulder. Good play. Antonio Trapp, that's so well done. That is one of the toughest plays to defend in all of football, Paul. Those back shoulder throws. 
Drew Estrada has had a big night so far, but couldn't come up with that one. Nice job by Trapp. You just keep playing. He's in man-to-man -man coverage there. He sees Estrada slow down, just gets that right hand in there. Really like that play by Trapp. Interesting call on third down and one. Good throw, just a nice job of defense. Scott Boylan deep for the Bears. Yeah, I wonder how head coach Buddy Tevens feels about that. You gotta think he'd rather be turning the clock and keeping the clock moving on the ground on third and one. Count of 39 yards and no return. 6.47 left in the third quarter at Fenway. We'll see if the Brown offense can get something going here, trailing by 27. Welcome back to Fenway Park, everybody. Uh, Ross and Paula have found a new place to stay warm, a very special one at that. This is the Red Sox dugout. Now it'll be Alex Cora, the new manager's home base. Not too much stuff in it right now, but I want to show you another really cool thing. I remember from my days working here at Fenway Park, this tunnel behind the Red Sox dugout goes all the way. So this tunnel right near the Red Sox dugout, if you can just look down that hallway, we can't get back there because that's where the locker rooms are right now. But down that hallway is where the clubhouse is for the Red Sox. Just such a cool place to be here at Fenway Park. And then right above the Red Sox dugout, just tons and tons of fans. Paul? Carolyn, thank you. And you know, we're all fans at heart. I've always wondered what it looks like down there. Yeah. And Ross and I had a chance, Carolyn, to go down there. And Brown comes out with a completion for a first down. Move the chains there. And we walk down that tunnel. And as you saw there, there's a wall. You go up to the left, up the stairs a couple of flights. And that's where you find the Red Sox clubhouse. Looks like it's had some work in the last 105 years. But yes. Not a lot. It was nice. Just a it little. was nice, yeah. And there you go. You see all the way down there. If you get that exit sign, you go up to the left. There's a flight of steps. And you walk in there. And... We had a nice chat with Phil Estes in the, what is the manager's room. Yeah, and, the, and then the wall had a picture of all of the managers. And who was the manager in 1907, Ross? Was that Cy Young? There you go. Yes. You saw me taking a picture of that. I saw you taking a picture, but I'm not a baseball trivia guy. Don't ask me any other baseball. <laughs> now you've got one. Yes. Now I like it. That. And, Ross, you were out talking to, to players in the field. I went down the third base side and went into the visitors' clubhouse and saw Dartmouth quite a bit smaller, more confined, as you would Interesting, expect. Interesting, yeah. Not, not as much... Uh, not as homey. Yeah, not, not as much uh, enhancement has been done on that, on that side. The guys were getting to know each other in there awfully tight, and the coaches included there. Let's see if Brown can... There they go. Punch it inside of Dartmouth territory. And really, Ross, whether it's the run game or Linta under duress and being knocked to the ground, when they have the ball, they being Brown, it's been all about the Dartmouth defense so far. Well, there's a reason why Dartmouth's defense is so highly touted. We talked about it earlier. They had a shutout last week against Cornell, their first one since 2013. First shutout of Cornell in 41 years. See that there at the bottom. Really impressive group. And then you have that. Linza puts it right on Anton Casey. Had a little bit of room to run, and it just falls out of his hands. Man. And that would have moved the chains. That would have been a first down. Everything went well there. Pretty good protection. Linza with a nice throw. Casey just not able to haul it in. That's one that he knows he should have caught. And that, it's, been like, it's been that kind of season, really, for Brown. Paul, they just can't all put it together at the same time. Especially offensively. Seventh punt coming up now for the Bears. Skipped back to him. Danny McManus. Back to receive, and we'll watch it roll down to the 13-yard line. Let's move our thoughts towards South Bend. November 18th, star running back Josh Adams and the third-ranked Fighting Irish continue their run toward the college football playoff as they host one of their oldest rivals, Notre Dame and Navy, Saturday, November 18th on NBC. I love watching those games. I love that Notre Dame still plays 
some of the service academies tomorrow night. Huge game, obviously, for the Irish. They have a great chance to make the college football playoff. I mean, they really do. The way they've played so far this year. Adams is a Southeast Pennsylvania kid. Remember him playing high school at Central Buck South High School. Think about he and Saquon Barkley both played in Eastern Pennsylvania the same year. High school football graduated. Great anticipation and a nice catch there. Hunter Hagdorn from Hennigan. Hagdorn with a couple of touchdown receptions in the first half. That's a gain of 10 yards. Hagdorn had a number of FBS offers coming out of high school down in Manville, Texas, near Houston, including some of the Texas schools, but realized that there was a unique opportunity to come here to Dartmouth. Miles Smith cuts it back up. Two plays on this drive. And two first downs for the Big Green, gain of 14. This is one of the things, too, Paul, that's so cool about the Ivy League. You'll see Miles Smith. It's just a sweep to the right. And a nice job by San Martino getting the block on Banfield. But you got a quarterback from the Bay Area. The previous play, he threw the ball to a wide receiver from Texas. Then he handed it to a running back from Georgia. Now you got the backup quarterback from upstate New York. Gerbino's in there. Estrada, the wide receiver with that carry from Gerbino. And Kevin Daff, the offensive coordinator for Dartmouth in his first year, we were talking to him about playing Gerbino. He said, this is the first time I've ever played two quarterbacks. And he goes, the game itself has evolved, and I have to evolve. And he realized right away on campus he needed to find a way to get him the ball. And a few snaps of quarterback has really been his way. And he's a former quarterback himself, so you know those guys don't ever like splitting time. Exactly, especially a senior quarterback, Miles Smith. And thinking about Hennigan and going from his junior year to his senior year, which Ross for him is going from year one to year two as a starter, you always hear this cliche, well, the game finally slowed down for him. And I asked him, what specifically does that mean for you? And I loved his response. He said, I feel more calm and I feel more present. I feel more in control. We've seen that a lot from the pocket here tonight. Comes back to the left side, and converting on third down is one way a quarterback can show he's calm and in control. He certainly plays that way, doesn't it? Doesn't he? Plays like there's just no panic to him. Of course, his father, Lau Hennigan, played at Penn and then worked in the league office, worked with the Cleveland Browns. So it's been a football life for Jack. So very good command of the offense, too. Thanks to the offensive line, he's had the ability to look one way and come back the other. He certainly knows where his second and third receivers are. Nice job by the Brown defense to throw down Miles Smith just as he got to the line of scrimmage. Kutchke with the tackle for the Bears. Brown's got a pretty good defensive front, too. Hoyt and Banfield and Jarvis and that time Kutchke. Look at that. It's cool to see Fenway Park, the green monster right out there. All lit up. It's awesome. UMass and Maine will play here tomorrow as part of the Fenway Gridiron Series. And he can flush down to his left. Awfully close to crossing the line of scrimmage. That's a pick. Oh, I thought he had it. In and out of the hands of Hunter Hagdorn. He must have said Hagdorn was already had the ball when he was out of bounds. It's Antonio Trapp. Thought he had the interception. They're talking about it now. They're talking. Let's take a look at it. Hagdorn goes up. He's in bounds, still in bounds. Ball's in bounds. I think that's interception, Paul. He's got control of it. Now his feet were out of bounds here throughout the juggling act. That to me, I don't see what what's not the interception there. No replay booth available here in the Ivy League. Which is a shame, really. Yeah, his left foot, Antonio Traps, was out of bounds as he was trying to gain control. Third down and ten. They've been successful on third down tonight. Six out of ten times they've converted. Brown rushes four. Don't get to him. And Hennigan just fires high to Hunter Hagdorn. 
little more throwing from Dartmouth than I would expect at this point, right? Up 27 points. It's been their identity to, to run more than they throw anyway. You got the cold and the wind and a 27-point lead, but you also have a senior quarterback who's having a big night. Isaac Whitney back to receive for Brown. Dartmouth coming into tonight, having shut out Cornell last week. Four-way tie for second place. One game behind Yale in the Ivy League. Found a 37 yards with no return. And there we are here, right down the, I guess the first baseline will be right in front of us. Ross and I both going with the stocking cap for the second half, although I think you had it on in the first half the as well. The whole time, the whole time. It's legitimately cold. We haven't complained at all, but if you're going to ask me about it, I'm going to tell you. If you've That's been, where we are. Been listening at home at any time, thought, would Paul and Ross sound a little bit cold? A little bit marbled. <laughs> Marble mouth. And there you can see why. Teeth chattering a little bit. There's a luxury box behind us. It looks awfully nice. Looks luxurious <laughs> right about now, doesn't it? Wind chill down to 12 degrees. Linda had time initially. Nice job of on the coverage there by the big green defense. It'll bring up second down and 10. That kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier. You know, that time he had pretty good protection early, but then nobody was open. Nobody was there. They just can't, can't seemingly get it all together. And some of the best things they've done have just been some of those wide receiver screens. You know, I'm always of the mindset, Paul, just keep throwing them until they stop it. Just keep throwing right. the wide receiver screen. See if they can stop it. Get some yardage. And they, they continue to play with soft corners, which means they're about seven or eight yards off the wide receivers. That throw is still there. And Linsa just goes down at the seven. Eventually, the Dartmouth front four got to him. And again, they're trying to run longer routes down the field, and Linsa couldn't find anybody. And when he was just about to throw it, the pocket caved in on him. Ian Hanselman credited with that sack. And once again, the big green coverage was there too. But TJ Lint had just been under duress the majority of the night. That was the first sack, but he's been knocked down well into double digits. Empty backfield now on third and 16. There's the throw you're looking for, Ross, but with 16 yards to go, it's going to be tough to get it. And LJ Harriet picks up eight, well short. Tackled by Jack Trainer. And Brown's going to have to punt yet again. And they'll probably wait until the quarter to do it. Or at least they can if they want. Now down to five seconds. Yep. Snapped it with one. McManus, did he touch that ball? It's gonna he did. That's a muff. Yeah, it's going to be kick-catch interference, I think. Penalty flag did come in there. You got to give him. There's no halo rule. But you have to give the returner the ability to catch the football. And number two for Brown, Condamina. To quell Condamina, really didn't. Hang on. Might be an untimed down. We'll see what the call is. Big play in the third quarter for Dartmouth. The pick six return by Jarius Brown. Kick catch interference. Number two, the kicking team. It's a 15 yard penalty from the squad of the foul. The period will be extended by an untimed down. The old untimed down, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> Brown now with seven penalties for 56 yards. We were talking about delay a game early. Snapping the ball with one second left there, that, that was a delay a game, Austin. Yes.
I'm not sure the players are, are, are understanding or aware of the untimed down here. They look like they're waiting for the start of the fourth quarter. And we have one down to play here in the third. We're ready, Ross. Let's do it. Hannigan back out on the field. Look at that field position, too, they get now. 32 tail back to his left is Miles Smith. And there is your untimed down to end the third quarter. So the second quarter was all about the Dartmouth passing game. Pass defense steps up. Jarius Brown with a pick six for Buddy Tevens in the third quarter. Brown did not turn that turnover into anything. It's been all big green. We head to the fourth. They're on top by 27. Get warm, coach. Now it's the defense scoring some points for Dartmouth. Jerry is Brown with the pick six, and they've extended the lead 30-3 to three as we head to the fourth quarter. Stay tuned. Growing your business isn't just one thing. It's a million little things. Should you lease, rent, or own? How fast can you get that part? Does it fit the budget? That's what your local cap table is here for. With expert advice, flexible financing, and industry-leading equipment, you can get the job done day after day. For a limited time at Milton Cat, get 0% for 60 months on select new Cat Compact equipment. As a trusted choice firm, the Richards Group has been committed to local communities for decades. We take the time to get to know our clients, their needs, and budget. We're independent, so we work for you, not an insurance company. We use our expertise to find our clients the best home, auto, and business coverage at the most competitive price. Our team provides consulting services for employee benefits, retirement plans, human resources, and leadership development. The Richards Group. Prepare for tomorrow by contacting us today. Fourth and final quarter here at Fenway. We know Jack Hannigan's done a terrific job today. We might get to see a little Jared Gerbino as well to put the finishing touches on a big win at Fenway. One quarter left to play here at Fenway Park. Dartmouth in control from start until now, leading 30-3. to three. Fenway Gridiron Series will continue tomorrow. Fourth quarter coming up. Let's go to the sideline first and check in with Carolyn Mano. Paul, thank you. Joining me now is Robin Harris, the commissioner of the Ivy League. How happy are you that there are seven different teams contending for the Ivy title at this point in the season? You know, it really is a lot of fun because it just shows the level and the quality of Ivy League football. And it, uh, every team is fighting for something with two weeks to go in the season. It's so incredibly exciting. And it's a testament to how hard our players are uh, working and every week as is what you've done outside of the conference. Yes, we've had, thank you for raising that, because we've had a fantastic non-conference schedule this year. We had our best non-conference win-loss record in over 20 years. We started the season with the best record the first two weeks since 1970. And so it's really been a wonderful uh, testament to how good Ivy football is. Robin, can you tell me what it's like to be warm inside <laughs> above Fenway Park where the food is and the hot chocolate is? It must be a nicer place to watch the game, although the sidelines are pretty good too. You know, it's actually been interesting to watch the fans in the stand migrate to the warmer parts of Fenway. And there are warmer parts of Fenway tonight. And it has been wonderful to visit with so many people here. We have two current Ivy presidents who are here. We have a former Ivy League president who's here. We have deans and vice presidents. And Everybody's and here. A ton of alumni. And most of them are staying warm. Well, you go get warm yourself. Thank you so much for spending a couple of minutes with us. Thank you, Carolyn. Paul? Hey, Carolyn, thank you very much. Nice job. And, and she was up here in the suite just behind us, Ross, at halftime keeping warm. She's really done a tremendous job. I mean, the Ivy League is as strong as it's ever been on a bunch of different levels. Gerbino in at quarterback, powering his way and staying on his feet inside the 10-yard line. Impressive run for Jared Gerbino. 
The guy is automatic in short yardage situations. You see, he, he has a great feel for running the ball and does a nice job breaking tackles. He's a big body to pr try to bring down. I mean, he won that pen game earlier in the year on NBCSN. Trevino going to stay in at quarterback. Estrada in motion. Fakes the give, keeps it himself down the five yard line. Doesn't feel like they need to do anything else, does it? Right. You know, it feels like another run or two by Gerbino could be. And Dartmouth could put this one away. Although they're going to bring him out of the game or no, no they're nope. not. Nope. nope. That's a long Stay way to run. <laughs> you can't tell from, from that angle, but it's a they have to run all the way to the other end of the field. Remember, both teams are on the same sideline. Dartmouth is all the way to your left. So Gerbino thought he was coming out. He's going to have to run about 80 yards. See if he could run five into yeah, the end zone here. I was just going to say, I think he's going to try to run five. Looking to pass, keeps it himself. And down to the two-yard line. We're talking to Kevin Daff, the offensive coordinator during the week for Dartmouth. I asked if he had a specific number of plays or time of game he wanted to get Gerbino in. He said, no, we let the game talk back to us. We throw him in there and see how they react to him, how he reacts to the game, and then decide if he's going to get more time. They've decided to take him out here. I'm a little surprised, aren't you? I mean, third and well. goal from the two. Two Gerbino runs. You'd think that they would get in. Maybe they want to give Miles Smith a touchdown. See if number 28 can get in. Smith is the tailback to the left of Jack Hennigan. Hennigan to the air. Try to give him another touchdown pass. It is a touchdown, but there is a penalty marker down it was thrown just before yeah they're going to bring this back emory thompson caught that ball and this is going to get buddy Tevens frustrated again the call pick the old pick play pass interference number one of the offense 15 yard penalty third down i always like to believe it was accidental pick Ross. Well, well look at the top of your screen hunter hagdorn there you're allowed to run your route but he was pretty clearly really trying to just push his defender off of him to try to get in the way of the brown bear running over the top who is the linebacker brendan pine big penalty 15 yards back another reason why you don't throw down there when you got Gerbino. that's cur curious play calling and he's the guy who got you down there and you're up 27. And what are the odds that Brown would have stopped Trevino on two more runs there, third and fourth down? Miles Smith jumps back into the backfield. Third and goal. Come underneath, and they get some of that yardage back. Emery Thompson once again with the catch inside the 10-yard line. And all that will do is make it a shorter field goal attempt for David Smith. I think it did a good job just corralling that snap right there. That was a low shotgun snap. David Smith from 26 yards out. The wind whipping, but for the most part at his back down there. He drills it right down the middle. A lot of threes on the scoreboard here early in the fourth quarter. Big green, big lead of 30 points. Coming up next weekend on Saturday, the game Harvard and Yale from the Yale Bowl. Ross and I will be there 1230 Eastern. Make a note, it's on CNBC. Looks good there, just beneath the World Series champion banner. Yeah, really. That game will be huge next week. Should be, at least. Especially if Yale and Harvard both win tomorrow. Yale at Princeton Grants. Yeah, and Harvard's hosting Penn. Justin Watson and the boys. Isaac Whitney on the return, or with the return. Time now for our Subway Fresh Take. Well, my subway fresh take has just been this Dartmouth defense, especially their linebackers, but really everybody. Jake Trainer, Moen coming off the edge. 
And of course, Jarius Brown with the play that really took the wind out of Brown's sails to start the second half. That one really hurt. Yeah, the Dartmouth defense has come up with play after play, Ross. And a couple of times tonight, Brown has had the ball. They started with good field position. They just haven't been able to do anything running or passing. They completed some passes and threw it. It looks like there's an injury all the way over on the Brown sideline. And it's Whitney. That's right where he went down. happened on the return on this play right here kind of got slung down at the end take another look at it the senior quarterback for Brown stays in that's TJ Linta 17 out of 35 so far tonight 18 out of 36 fumble Landberg put it on the turf and recovered by Brown. It really feels like that's almost what Linta does best. Get the ball out and throw it on a line to one of his receivers. Let them make a move and get up the field. That would be the focal point of my offense if I were coaching at Brown. Get the ball out of Linta's hands quickly. He's got a strong arm to be able to throw those out routes and those quick screens quickly. There we go. There you go, Ron. Somebody's listening to you. Anton Casey with the reception. Gain a nine. There's TJ Linta with his mom, Kathy, and dad, Joe, on the right. His dad, Joe, of course, on the right, was my agent. Of course. During my seven years as a player. Better known, much better known as Joe Flacco's agent and Brian Hoyer and Kyle Juszczyk and Cam Brait. He's got a lot of the Ivy League guys. I can tell you right now, he changed my life. I would not be up here calling this game or would not have had seven years. We wouldn't have had seven days if it wasn't for him. By like finding a good home for you? Getting yeah, you the right he's, the, he's the only agent to call. This reverse here set up by Brown. That's their top wide receiver, Jacob Prawl, around the left side. And Dartmouth responding with a some quick pursuit there to shove him out of bounds. Yeah, I like it, though. I like the play call here. Get the ball to Prawl. And that's the thing that Coach Dobes told us, the defensive coordinator for Dartmouth. He said, the best thing we do right now is run the ball, and when we get there, we got a little bit of a nasty edge to us. And Dartmouth has rotated some second string guys in there, but still, for the most part, the starters. They're not taking anything for granted here, even though they're up 30 with less than 10 minutes remaining. And they're blitzing as well. Jacob Crawl with the reception there. So you got a defense with both the head coach, Buddy Tevens, defensive coordinator, like a whole lot. He talked about the nasty edge they have at the end of the play. We also discussed how he thinks it's a smarter group than he had last year. You've got a senior quarterback. So you compare Dartmouth at 3-2 and two with the other teams that are a game back at 3-2, and two, and it is a four-way tie right now. Where do you think Dartmouth lines up? You know, I'd say that they're probably the next best team. You know, right up there, Certainly with Harvard. You know, Dartmouth's the only team to beat yet. Right. Yale's 4-1, and, and Dartmouth was down 21 points in that game. Yeah. Paul, and came all the way back to beat Yale. A game, by the way, that Tony Reno, the Yale head coach, said was actually good for Yale because things have come so easily for them this year that they kind of needed that wake-up call. You look at Yale, almost every other game, Paul, they've just been blowing people out. It seems amazing. to me like Yale has the most talent and is the best team this year, and they've certainly stayed the healthiest. First to 10 now for Linza. And had that one dropped by LJ Harriet. It's amazing that you're saying that about Yale, and I back that up, what I've seen from them. Impressive, uh, minus that, that close loss to Dartmouth. They struggled so mightily last year. Oh, remember that Just pen a year game? Ago. The pen game? Yeah. And really, the uh, even the Columbia game, until... Until, until they put Rawlings in. Rawlings, until you know, Rawlings until, came in, until yeah. Until they put Rawlings in, and everything kind of changed. Once they put Rawlings in, isn't it amazing? How, and it's not all on the quarterback. I, I don't know what the psychodynamics are there. It's just unbelievable. Dartmouth brought six that time. 
Uh, Harriet Higgs on that side, gain of five. Dartmouth blitzes more when they're up by 30 than they do <laughs> during the regular part of the game. Dartmouth well on the way, on their way to move into four and two in the Ivy League. Put them temporarily a half game behind Yale. Brown now finding some success through the air. Blandberg hauls that one in, turns it up, first down. And this is kind of what Brown used to do all the time on offense, and really what they probably should do all the time on offense. Short passing game, quick passing game, ball out of the hands of the quarterback quickly. Dartmouth's in a weird situation, Paul, where tomorrow they'll be rooting for Princeton, and next week they play him. That's right. Linta steps up, firing deep and nearly intercepted. Ball set. There with the coverage, Ross Wood. What do you think tomorrow, Princeton Yale? Well, Princeton's just so decimated in the front seven defensively. I mean, they're down to one starter. I think they've lost like 70 linemen at this point. That that will be a challenge for them to stop Zane Dudek, the electric freshman running back for Yale on the Yale offense. Princeton's best shot to win that game, Paul, is a shootout. Is Chad Kanoff getting the ball to his big receivers. And if Princeton wins the game, it's probably like 41-38. Similar to the score last week against Penn, 38-35. Good strike by Lintz, it's a Blandberg. Turns the corner, was the knee down. Touchdown, Brown. Discussion still going on, but as for now, we'll call it six. Just an in-breaking route, a dig route. Blandberg, ooh, you know what? Live, I thought his knee went down, but looking at the monitor again, it looked like he, he did keep that knee off the ground. Watch right here. I thought he went down right there, but I think he the knee just stayed off enough until he crossed the plane. Good effort by Blamberg. Another one of these sophomore receivers for Brown. Out of Orange County, California. Turned that corner and found a way to get in. Brown offense produces a touchdown. Just inside of seven minutes left to play here at Fenway Park. 29 yards. Linta to Blamberg. Go ahead and feel good about it. 33-10, Dartmouth on top. Jalen Blandberg getting tuned up on the sideline moments ago. First touchdown of the game for Brown. He scored the touchdown pass from T.J. Linta. 10 plays, 69 yards. Paul Burmeister, Ross Tucker, and Carolyn Mano, Fenway Park. Red Sox have called it home since 1912. Dartmouth and Brown played here a couple of times before, but that was back in 1922 and 1923. Looks like we're going to expect an onside kick here. With Brown down 23. Hagdorn. Who else? For your hands, team, you might as well have your top receiver. Unbelievable. Right? He is really a good player. Dartmouth quarterback Jack Hennigan has been awfully impressive tonight. With more on that family, let's check in with Carolyn. Well, thank you. I'm here with Jack's parents, Amy and Lel, who could not be happier at Fenway Park, even though it's a little bit colder in temperature, and they do hail from San Francisco. What has this football team meant to your son? This is his family. He, um, he loves these men. He, um, he is, he's become a great man because of them. Uh, they mean everything to him. Yeah. And he comes from football stock because, from what I understand, Lel, you were a tight end at Penn, and they won the championship when you played there, and that's how you two met. Is that right? That's right. Well, his football talent is from his mother, uh, but hopefully his humility from his dad. Yeah. And mom gets the smarts as well? Yes, that would be, that would be mom. So what's next uh, for Jack in the next steps after his football season wraps up? Well, I think he's just going to relax after the Princeton game for a bit, and then he's going to be moving back to San Francisco. That's fantastic. So there is a crowd. There's many more of you here. They have slowly migrated out of the cold weather, and they're starting the celebration six minutes and 33 seconds early. But you know what? I think they're in okay shape, Paul. Hey, Carolyn, thank you very much. And it's good for any of us to get humility and smarts from mom's side, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. And as you pointed out, Dad Lau uh, had, a, had a good run in the NFL. 
Yeah, well, yeah, it, as an executive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Jack told us during the week he would love to keep playing football for as long as he can, but whenever that's wrapped up, uh, as his mom mentioned, going to move back to San Francisco and would like to work for a private investment firm. Did some internship work back home in Northern California over the summer and will be heading back to that kind of work whenever his football career wraps and up. And that's the thing too, Paul, with all these guys we see out here. You know, the reality, no matter what the score is at the end of the game, they're really all winning by having the opportunity to go to these schools. I mean, you've got two boys. How cool would that be? Get a chance to play football in the Ivy League. It really is like a fraternity. Back at quarterback is Jake Pilata in for Dartmouth. And a completion for a first down there to who else? Drew Estrada has been impressive with those hands tonight. It's kind of funny, Paul. Pretty much every job interview I went on when I was a senior in college at Princeton, every time the guy interviewed me, he's like, oh, yeah, I played football at Yale. Oh, yeah, I played football at Cornell. <laughs> every interview, the guy had played Ivy League football. It's pretty awesome. It's fun during the week, whether we meet with them in person or talk to them on the phone. There's, there's a maturity with the majority of those kids that really shines through, and you can see how they would meet anybody well whenever the time comes to start looking for the next thing after football. Rashad Cooper, healthy again, as Buddy Tevens pointed out during the week to us, up the middle. Clock now ticking inside of five minutes. Some good senior quarterbacks we've seen so far this year. We've seen one tonight, Jack Hennigan. Just met his mom and dad, thanks to Carolyn. Chad Kanoff, we've seen him a couple of times. When you compare those two senior quarterbacks for the next level, what do you see? Well, I, I think the numbers for Kanoff this year are going to get him a lot of opportunities. And he was a pretty heavily recruited kid that signed with Vanderbilt coming out of high school and then changed his mind to go to Princeton. I think the numbers that he's put up, you know, completing over 75% of his passes, that's going to at least get him into a camp somewhere because he's got that kind of accuracy. I mean, we, we did that Harvard game a few weeks ago. The ball didn't touch the ground in the whole first half. I mean, that was extremely impressive. That's one of the things, too, that Buddy Tevens, the head coach for Dartmouth, pointed out to us just about where the league is right now. You know, more and more guys in the NFL than ever before. More and more guys getting into pro camps and scouts coming to games. Every Friday night we've seen scouts. It's really impressive. They said the scouts are around during the week all the time now. Really, all these schools. And you've known the Ivy League and the makeup of this, uh, of all the personnel. We see some of the some of the former Ivy League players in the NFL now. But you pointed that out to me throughout the past few years as we've called these games together. Is these guys are there throughout the week too. It doesn't matter what school you're at now. They're going to be able to find you. I mean, look at it. There's like 20 guys right now that are getting a paycheck from an NFL team. It was not like that. You know, I think when I was playing from 01 to 08, there might have been three or four of us, maybe, Paul. Really? Matt Burke. I mean, there was not very many. What do you think's happened? It's a good question. I, I think a big factor has been the financial aid. You know, the financial aid packages for these schools are so good that, you know, a lot of these kids are able to go to these schools for very little money. Some, some don't have to pay at all. You know, it's all need-based financial aid. And that's it's, pretty it's new. It's not an athletic scholarship. It's better than it was. It's better than it was. Yep. They've increased that. I also think, though, that the success that Matt Burke and Ryan Fitzpatrick and certain guys have had is, has led the scouts to give these guys more of a chance, to give them more of a look. Plus, there's 90-man rosters now in training camp before it used to be 80. So more guys just get that initial opportunity. Carolyn Mano. Has been moving around. She's been active. Where's Waldo? Where's Mano? Let's see where she is. Carolyn, where this are you? Is, you guys, this is the only thing that I have left for you. I climbed a couple of stairs, and now I am atop the glorious green monster. I will say there's a couple of fans who are diehards who are up here. There may be a little bit of beer involved. There's a lot of hand warmers involved. They've been watching the game up here faithfully. But in, in all seriousness, just walking through 
Fenway Park and seeing, you know, the wooden seats and coming up to the Green Monster and just looking down at this beautiful field below that they've set up for this event. I couldn't be more happy just to be here with you guys celebrating it and bringing you some of the ins and outs of Fenway Park. It's been such a great time. And I would like to go inside soon. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go inside soon? Carolyn's tough, man. <laughs> Carolyn's tough. She has a few hideouts by now. I, th I think she she knows where to and go. She can go right downstairs and, and right to where she was inside the she's scoreboard from here. Florida in the first quarter. too. She was from Florida. It's true. <laughs> College athlete for the Florida Gators. She, she's tough. She's Florida tough. She worked in this market though, so she she knows the deal. Callous to the weather here this time of year. She's tougher than I am. I can tell you that much right now. <laughs> You wouldn't have got. You know what though? She's moving around, like, walking up the steps to get to the green monster. That helps. Now inside a minute. That'll do it. And Dartmouth can just take a knee now. Can now officially enjoy a second consecutive win. Shut out last week over Cornell. An impressive performance today, 33 to 10 over Brown, which will push them to four and two, half game behind Yale. And they'll just sit back and see. What happens with the action tomorrow? And Ross, the, the hope for a seven-way tie <laughs> atop the Ivy League That's is alive and well. It's clear that you want that. <laughs> it's a great story. I mean, come on. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. If seven of the eight teams in the conference could lay claim to the title, that's not so bad. Of course, Yale can take care of all that with a win tomorrow against Princeton, then a win the following Saturday against Harvard. If seven win the championship, did anybody win the championship? That would be my question. Buddy Tevens, his team looking pretty good from start to finish tonight. They win over Brown 33 to 10. We're back to Fenway right after this. Well, from wire to wire, the Big Green win it at Fenway Park, 33 to 10 over Brown. An impressive win in just about every department for Dartmouth as they continue an impressive 2017 season. Today's game is brought to you by the Richards Group. The Richards Group is proud to be the official insurance agency of Dartmouth Athletics. They are local, independent, and committed to the Upper Valley, so contact them to review your home, auto, and business insurance needs. Our friends at the Richards Group say, go Big Green. Hard to believe, folks, but we've got just two weeks left in the 2020 Woods Watch Party. Can't wait to see what we've got in store for you to wrap things up here in 2020. Thanks for joining us all season long. We'll see you next week.